I now declare that the Plano City Council preliminary open meeting is reconvened in open session, that all council members are present. The first item is item one. Our first item's preliminary agendas is consideration and action resulting from the executive session. <clears throat> Being none, I'll go to item two. Uh, personnel. Item A, Community Relations Commission, interim member. Who is that? Mayor Pro Tem and uh, Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem and I have uh, discussed this and narrowed things down to a couple of folks, and ultimately uh, we're going to appoint uh, Amit Warkid to uh, fill the uh, interim position. Second. Uh, to the Community Relations Commission. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand. Thank you. Motion passes 8 to 0. And the other item is the Library Advisory Board uh, interim member. Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member Williams and I have conferred about this, and uh, we would uh, recommend Michael Tan for this position, so I will make a motion uh, that we appoint uh, Michael Tan uh, for the interim spot on the Library Advisory Board. The wrong button. Second. Okay, so I have a motion and a second to uh, appoint Michael Tan to the Library Advisory Board. All in favor? Motion passes at NATO. Thank you. Uh, next item, uh, item three, comprehensive monthly finance report. Denise Stackey. Good evening. So we are calling this the monthly report, but it's actually our year-end numbers. So we have a full years of accounting for this. So this is for September of 2021. And our first slide represents our revenues compared to budget by fund. The general fund has revenues of 311.3 million for the fiscal year. This represents 102.4% of the total annual re-estimated budget Always good news when we're over 100% on revenues. The Water and Sewer Fund has 166.4 million in revenues, which represents 99.3% of total annual re-estimated budget. Here we're looking at our expenditures compared to budget by fund. The general fund has expenditures of 280.4 million for the fiscal year, and that represents 109.1% of the re-estimated budget. The Water and Sewer Fund has expenditures of 149.1 million, and that represents 106.5% of the total annual budget. Here we're looking at our net change in fund balance for the past three years. In the general fund for the fiscal year, the fund balance has decreased by 639,000. However, this does include a million, an unrealized loss of $1 million for the mark-to-market -mark adjustment required by GASB Statement 31. The Water and Sewer Fund balance has decreased by 7.2 million. This is the worst position than we were in the prior year, um, and which had this fund at a $3 million decrease last year. This is primarily due to the fact that we weren't collecting um, because of the pandemic. There were a lot of people that were behind um, in their payments. The Environmental Waste Services Fund has decreased by 302,000 and the Municipal Drainage Fund is doing well and has increased by 1.5 million. Here we have our general fund revenues compared to actual. Um, the general fund revenues are higher than the prior year by $11.4 million. This is represented through an increase in property taxes of $4.8 million. Additionally, our sales tax revenue, thankfully, has started to recover and has increased by $5.7 million over the prior fiscal year, even though we had a negative audit adjustment of $1.6 million. Um, there was also an increase in building permit revenue of $2.8 million. And several other categories of revenues showed a rebound from the pandemic, such as recreation, membership fees, and swimming pool admissions. <clears throat> Those increases are offset by decreases in court fines of 486,000 
franchise fees are down by 1.8 million, and our interest income is also down by 2.8 million, and again, that's due to the quarterly market value, um, Gatsby 31 adjustment, which is an unrealized loss. General fund expenditures are higher than the prior year by 5.4 million. Personnel costs increased by 5.1 million. That's offset by a reimbursement against expenditures of 9.7 million that came from CARES funding. However, last year our reimbursement from the CARES funding was actually $14 million, so that's why you're seeing the difference between this year and last year. And our health claims fund, we've had a decrease in our fund balance of about 4.8 million. This is mostly due to the increase in expenses as employees began going back to the doctor and they were have, catching up on their routine exams that were put off during the pandemic. Um, we also had a lot of large claimants this year, um, so that impacted us. So our fund has a fund balance of 16.6 million. Um, our policy is to keep six months worth of claims plus IBNR, the incurred but not reported claims, um, in that fund balance and we are slightly below that. So this will be something we need to look at in the current fiscal year that we need to improve upon. Our unemployment rates in June were at 5% and they have decreased to 3.8% in September. When we look forward to our sales tax for the month of October, that was up compared to the prior year by 17.85%. Um, we're finally seeing that recovery in sales tax that we were hoping for, so um, this is good news. Our real estate market recap shows the number of days on the market was at 12 days in June. It is now in 20 days in September. The percentage of asking price was at 102% in September, and that's decreased from the 105% high that it was in June. Our average selling price for a home in Plano was at 548,080 in June, compared to 534,153 in September, so it's gone down just a little bit. However, our price per square foot in June was 186. This compares to 191 in September. Another fund we're seeing recover a little bit, our hotel occupancy tax is up by 220,000 compared to the prior fiscal year. Again, it's gonna take a while for this industry to rebound after the pandemic. And finally, we're looking at our equity and treasury pool. Our enterprise funds have 20% of the equity. Um, the largest share of the equity is always capital projects funds. Um, that's at 36%, and again, those are because our bond proceeds are in there. The general fund has 10% of the equity. This slide represents our investment portfolio maturities. As you can see, we have those maturities spread out. We always like to see that. Um, the portfolio has a book value of $644 million as of September 30th. This is compared to 736 in June, so we have spent down some of that portfolio as we've completed capital projects. And then this final slide is our city maintains a diversified portfolio. The largest holding in the portfolio again is at 24.92% is the municipal bond holding we have. The next largest is our investment pools which are very, um, very liquid, able to access that cash very quickly if we need to. And then again, no one class of assets can have more than 50% in our portfolio. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Councilman Grady. Mr. Hackey, um, thank you for the presentation. I have a question on franchise fees. Okay. Um, with the way technology is going, I am wondering, are we taking a look at how we're budgeting for future franchise fees? Because I have this sort of gut reaction the way it's been going for the past many years that as technology ramps up it ramps up quickly in in a lot of areas those franchise fees will get smaller and smaller yeah. and we're going to begin to take a look at how we're going to have to offset that um, from a budgeting standpoint in revenue yes that is something that we need to look at because you're exactly right as people are cutting the cord as they say you know, we aren't getting some of those cable franchise fees and things like that. So that's something that um, Karen is looking at in the budget and it's something we're gonna have to adjust for and figure out, you know, how, how we move those revenues around to make up for it. 
Well, I think maybe the saving grace and in, in at least the revenue side of it is the sales tax side yes. um, did increase that kind of offsets are sinking that I see in the franchise fee. So thank you very much for looking at that. Yeah, you're welcome. <clears throat> Uh, I just have a question about the water and sewer. Um, my understanding is that because of the um, pandemic, a lot of people are not able to pay. Are, are we, um, is there any plans to um, recoup, or is there? Yeah, we we we're um, we've put people on a, um, payment plans, and so it's taken a while for us to be able to recoup it. Um, we, we really don't write off a lot of bad debt in that fund because there's no free water. So um, we, we usually do figure out how to recoup it. The only way we really lose it is if they move out of the city. And at that point in time, we flag their account. If they come back in, that amount has to be due if they try to reconnect their fees. So is there like um, some type of program in which they could possibly get assistance for? There, there is, and we refer them to um, Lori Schwartz's group whenever um, we have somebody that we think would be eligible for that. There are a couple other programs that are out there that give people assistance, and we try to refer them to those as well. Thank you. The, the real big part of this, though, is that we, we weren't collecting the late fees and that kind of thing. We shut that off during the pandemic, and that really, um, that really impacted us. Nice. So. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Our next item is the Library Departmental Report. Libby Holtman. Good evening. So you all have in front of you a folder that we provided. It's just a quick look back at our year. So whenever you have time, we invite you to view that and enjoy and enjoy the story. Um, <laughs> good evening, Mayor, City Council, and City Manager. I'm Libby Holtman, Director of Libraries, and I'm delighted to share information about your libraries this evening and Team PPL. We have five libraries across our city to serve, as well as an outreach vehicle. We operate as one library with five locations in all that we do. We continue to strive for excellence and service as a valuable resource and community partner. And this year, our staff reimagined our strategic direction. So we started with these three areas for our initiative. And of course, when it came to developing the goals, which are there in the gray, we used the City of Plano strategic vision as our base to start from. We looked at our initiatives, and then the staff themselves created the goals. So for engaging our community, Team PPL provides a consistent customer experience when you visit us, whether it's in a library or during outreach. This reinforces our one library, five locations approach to all of our business. Everyone supports outreach, and we use that outreach vehicle to deliver excellent service to our customers. For enriching lives, we work with partners and train staff to deliver classes that support workforce development, entrepreneurship, and we also offer volunteer opportunities. So our teens in Plano have a great start to their workforce experience at the libraries. This past year, we partnered with My Possibilities and their hipsters, and we're just now seeing our first graduating class, and we are so excited to celebrate them and provide them with that experience. We embrace opportunities to support patrons in their workforce development, personal growth, and desire for relevant learning resources. When you visit planolibrarylearns.org, that's our blog, you can see all of our classes, our content, and we have a new podcast listed there, so we invite you to visit us there. Under Educating Minds, a natural fit for libraries, right? So we offer resources and serve patrons of all ages and stages of life collaboration, and exploration. And under this initiative, we have our five focus areas for programming. So this is our great accomplishments of the past year. Um, we were reaccredited by the Texas State Library Archives Commission. We received the Texas Municipal Library Directors Association Award for Excellence in 2020. We also received a Texas Library Association Branding Iron Award for our Plano Library Learns blog. So. Go and visit that sometime. There's lots of great things there. And then that big gold star we're really proud of. The whole team pulled together, and we received the American Library Association Award, um, Information Today Library of the Future Award for our work with digital literacy in the community. And that really, our, our staff took tech training to underserved adults throughout out outreach classes, 
They took our devices into the community, our staff and our community partners, and we worked um, giving great classes to Chase Oaks Family Center, the Brain Injury Network of Dallas, as well as local senior living facilities. And that was an exceptional award to win. Um, it was part of our annual conference, and so kudos to the team. Um, and then you can see we publish year-round. Our staff like to write about all the great things we're doing here in Plano. We serve as a resource for um, local libraries as well as our state, um, across the state, as well as the nation. So Team PPL does some great work. And here they are. It's one of my favorite slides. Um, <laughs> I just really wanted to share a little bit about them and the great work that they do in our community. People that choose to work in a library really choose this profession because they have a heart for community. They have a genuine curiosity of all the things. Um, they like to learn and they like to build relationships. And so with Team PPL, whenever you join our team, we say, hey, what skills and abilities do you have? How can we connect you to our initiatives to serve for classes and programming in the community? What can we do to highlight your skills and ability to benefit our community? And so our staff go about asset mapping themselves, and they tie that into our programming initiatives. And what we get is award-winning programs for our community. Um, and as an outward-facing department, our residents really um, needed our services this past year. Especially with the pandemic, we were often their place for internet access. We had experts willing to guide them, finding uh, meaningful resources. We kind of served as that socialization place, particularly online virtually for our adults and our seniors. In fact, um, we'll be continuing that because our seniors tell us they love it and we want to keep them happy and engaged with um, library programming. So I just would like to say kudos to the team, particularly this past year. I am so proud to work with them each and every day and they do amazing things. So our business snapshot for the past year, we were still quite busy. Um, many things still occurred. Uh, we had new audiences with adults and seniors, particularly in a virtual environment. People that had never attended a class with us in person came to us online in large, large numbers. So we could have a class in the library with 10 people for a computer class, but online virtually, it was 200, 300 people engaging and learning together. And so all of our classes are housed on our YouTube channel, which is why you see that huge increase in subscribers. So I would invite you to check it out in case you just wanna learn something new. Um, we were uh, appreciative of our friends giving us funds so that we could continue to um, invest in some digital resources. And our workforce development virtual classes really took off as well. So anything we offered with workforce development, socialization opportunities, we offered patrons our book a librarian service via Zoom. So a lot of people were getting acclimated to the digital environment. We were happy to help them do that. And for our youngest patrons, I have to say, giving them that experience at home to have story time giving that experience to do make it take it. So they'd come grab things from us and then join us online and we'd all do the program together and then they would take pictures and send it back to us on social media. It was heartwarming and it really meant a lot to our youngest customers at home. Um, this year we had an opportunity to implement a new ILS. It's kind of like our heart. It's the catalog you might use. But for staff, it was really impactful. We have a new mobile app. How many of you have downloaded it? That's a test. Thank you. <laughs> I would invite all of you to download our mobile app. It's the Plano Public Library. Through that app, once you sign in, you can check out your own materials when you come into the library by using your camera. You can access all of our digital resources. You can see the classes that we have going on. It's a phenomenal app. And um, for those of you who like to just grab and go, if you have a hold and it comes in, open the app, tell us you're on the way. We'll get ready, we'll check it out, and when you arrive, you say, I'm here. We put your items on the porch, and you can just grab and go. And it's been a great resource for our seniors and our young families. So as you might expect, we saw a slight change in our material circulation, but with um, patrons returning to our buildings in full, we fully expect our physical materials to go back up to what it was in a few years prior. And then our e-content just through the roof because as people were staying home, people discovered us. People that had never used us got library cards and just enjoyed all the resources and classes that we could offer. Materials, um, as you might expect, digital resources were really important to people. Luckily, right before the pandemic sort of hit, we had invested in a new resource called Press Reader, um, and that allows you to read magazines and newspapers from around the world. If you enjoy reading the Dallas Morning News, you can read it through this app. And so I would encourage you to check that out, but we also now, um, in the last 
month or two out at the Wall Street Journal, and then we continue to offer you the New York Times. So there's a lot of great digital resources you can use from home, and we'd encourage our patrons to do so. They've shown us that they really appreciate it because all of our numbers continue to go up with our digital resources. Learning kits continue to be popular with our families. We have those in a variety of um, subjects. Uh, STEAM-based subjects, um, sensory backpacks. We have kits for our youngest kiddos, so those are very well received. And of course, as you might expect, we offer materials in a variety of languages. Plano is a diverse community, and they appreciate having materials to read in their language. As I mentioned before, we have five programming focus areas, so whenever we're looking to create a class or gain a new partnership, these are the five areas that we hone in on. And staff know whenever they're creating a program, it must align with these areas as well. Our outreach and engagement team work with partners to bring in additional resources to meet these focus areas, and we're happy to broaden our reach into the community. Hashtag more than books. I feel like that is who we are. <laughs> if you had to ask, we are so much more than books. We bring so much to the community as um, public service. So it is the name of our outreach vehicle. You'll see it on the side of the van there. That's, um, we affectionately call it Big Blue. Um, Big Blue blows a thousand bubbles a minute when it goes out and does outreach. It's well received anywhere it goes, but we recently outfitted it with Wi-Fi so we can teach classes anywhere in our community. And when you think about emergencies or winter storms and things, it gives us a lot more capacity to deliver service. Um, our outreach takes our staff out into the community to share information about our library resources, and we really try and hone in on those non-users and underserved communities. We reach out to our other city departments and we ask if we can go with them on outreach and we all talk collaboratively so that we can just deliver the best service possible. So shifts that we saw this past year. So many things. <laughs> um, and people really shared that they needed us for digital resources. We were their place for internet access. Um, we were their workforce support in guiding them to new skills and abilities. And we were a place for community building. Even though it was virtual, it went quite well and people are not letting go of it. They're like, we wanna keep our book club and we wanna keep our senior um, conversations going. And so we'll continue to offer them. But we really were a part of people's daily routine during the shutdown piece, especially young children and families um, really appreciated the services we offered. We'll continue to build our relationships, particularly with seniors in our um, community. We will use our staff in whichever way the city needs it. Um, they're highly flexible. They have so many skills and abilities and educational backgrounds. Our staff speak over 25 different languages, so their ability to adapt to any situation is, is significant. You'll notice here on the right-hand side, that's one of our former supervisors. Um, she's doing a senior care call. And that was a program that the city spun up where city staff reached out and spoke to someone every two weeks. It was the same library staff member with the same senior patron. And that lasted about a year and a half. And you can imagine how that relationship began with, hey, where can I do this? How can I do that? And then at a year and a half, you're talking gardening and children and grandchildren. And it was really wonderful. But we had um, families reach out to us saying how much it meant to them that the city of Plano cared about their family member, enough to have somebody call them every two weeks and check in. We connected people to Lori's team, to, to the fire department, whatever their needs were. We did our best as library staff to just connect them to the resources. So um, that was a really, that one still warms my heart. And I know staff really enjoyed uh, doing that. And then our COVID call center, that was staffed by librarians. The city put up a, a call center and any question under the sun came in eight to five, Monday through Friday and librarians responded. Thank you to Shauna and her team for an excellent FAQ, but those calls were not easy. And um, I know it meant a lot to many of our residents. So going forward, right there is our Plano Library Learns Org. Um, that's our blog. You'll see our podcast on there, our classes, our resources. It's pretty much everything you could ever want. So check it out. <laughs> and then to the right there is the mobile app that I know you all will be downloading momentarily. Um, and that's our library mobile app where you can do so many great things. Um, that will help you. We're gonna to continue to do multiple outreach. We're gonna seek new partnerships that benefit our residents. We'll enhance our digital collections and always be looking for what's that next thing that can help? What's that next thing that we haven't even thought about? Because we sure weren't looking for COVID, but we were glad we had the resources to support residents um, throughout that process. We'll deliver virtual classes and we're doing in-person classes too. Our um, story times are back if you haven't been back in to enjoy them. 
So one other quick note, if you use OverDrive and you like to read eBooks or listen to e-audios, that's moving to the Libby app. You need to download the Libby app. It's super easy to use. And that's also um, going to be where our streaming platforms are. So um, if you haven't done that, you'll want to make that switch because they're going to put OverDrive to bed and Libby will be alive and kicking, so to speak. Um, we'll be having a new print management system we hope for patrons to use so they can do mobile printing in the beginning of the year. And then, of course, our 2017 bond projects, which are phenomenal. Um, Davis Library should hopefully complete early spring. And then we have Harrington Library at the end of the year. And I'm so excited for you to see those projects and enjoy the resources for those communities. And with that, our fabulous staff, and then I just want to point out, we do these spark spaces. They're kind of passive programs at all of our locations. And this was a note that a patron drew for us just last week, and I was like, that's going in the presentation. <laughs> because it, it really speaks to how we feel about the community and also how they feel about us. And so it's our absolute pleasure as Team PPL to serve. And um, I welcome any questions you might have. Thank you. Go ahead. Libby, would you go into a little bit further our relationship with my possibilities and the hipsters and the, the collaboration that's going on? I think that's something to uh, highlight for the community. Sure, I'd be happy to. So many, many years ago, Mark discussed <laughs> with me this opportunity. And um, we work with Karina Sadler, the VIP coordinator. They do a phenomenal job. And we built a relationship with my possibilities where libraries could offer some job work experiences. So we had um, a committee form from our staff that thought about what, what would be reasonable and what would be helpful as a, a meaningful job experience, something that would allow them to grow, would allow them to learn something new, but would also give them the socialization and kind of that real work experience. Um, at the libraries, it's completely volunteer. We don't pay, <laughs> but um, it's been really great. We're about to graduate, I think, the class this Friday at the library, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, and hopefully it'll continue to grow. Right now, it's just at Haggard Library. We had planned for it to be at Davis as well, and as you know, things happen, so we'll continue to grow this. I fully expect this to be a long-standing partnership with our department and them. Yep. Thank you. Sir. Council Warren Homer. I just wanted to say I had the opportunity to see Libby make a presentation at the Texas Municipal League a couple months ago, and I was just really proud uh, to be representing Plano there because when she was telling everyone in the audience what things Plano was doing during COVID to keep everyone connected, one thing I don't think you mentioned today was the fact that you guys got your stuff out on the trails. And oh, yeah. when the libraries were closed, you had staff out on the trails engaging with people and being a resource there because so many more people were out walking and exercising. So um, I just want to say thank you for representing Plano so well. You guys do great work. Thank you. It's our pleasure. And we were delighted to hit the trails. Thank you to Ron and his team for inviting us to join them. We go to any department. Pretty much we're friendly with anyone that you have an idea, a thought. We will make it happen because our staff are just delighted to serve. So thank you. Thank you so much, Libby. Well, on that same subject, Friends of Plano Public Library organization uh, has a donation presentation. I'll come up front and finish. You guys are beating me to it. But once again, Friends of the Plano Public Library organization is presenting a check to support the Plano Public Libraries. The organization has been supporting the Plano Library since 1965. And so I'd like to call forward Scott Johnson to say a few words and present the check to Libby and a Director of Libraries and Tammy Korn, Library Development and Outreach Manager. Any other board, well, you're all here. So, Scott, feel free. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the mayor had a good spot that the library started in 1965, the official department of the libraries, and the friends were started the same year as a support group. They are our sole <laughs> customer. So we've been very pleased to work with them to help lend them resources, our time, our money, and um, we've continued this for a long time. Starting from 2001, this check when added to the total, it would be over $2,100,000 in cash. 
in, in addition to that, many, many thousands of hours of volunteer work. So that um, libraries, I think, are very important to a community. And Plano just shines, as you heard from Libby. So that's, we want to keep that going. So tonight we have a, a check for $100,000. And we'll be um, presenting that. In you want it? I think you it deserves it. Right. Oh, I think it deserves it. I'm not saying I don't. I would just like. I'm to not saying I don't want it, but I think I think it's for Libby and, and the library. So, <laughs> so I will. I will. I you want to say something, Libby? I just had a quick. Go ahead. I can't. Is it on? I can't avoid this, but um, if you're not aware right now, we're having a book sale at Par Library. So I would just encourage you. It's in their program room. It's time to shop. Perfect. Don't miss it. Great <laughs> Christmas gifts. Move it down just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm pretty short, so I can do anything. <laughs> I Okay. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Now you can take it. Oh, yeah. Now you can to, Okay. To expand, to expand on the book sale, what we've been doing, and that's part of what's happened with the, um, you know, the COVID, is we do a bag of books at a different library branch. And this, this week it started Saturday and Sunday. It was at, is at Par Library and goes till next Saturday or Sunday. Very simple. $10 cash. You get a bag, fill it with books, bring exact change. Well, you know, can't make change. No credit cards. And um, we did one at Haggard Library a few months ago. It was successful. So we are trying to adapt to different ways of raising money at different times to make it convenient. So it also gets people out to see the library, libraries more. So thank you very much for the time tonight. And thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Take Thank care. you very much. Happy holidays to all. Thank you. Okay. Our next item is item six, building inspections department report. Sosomata. Chief Building is Official, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. It's nice to follow Libby and the libraries. I think everybody's in a great mood and ready to learn a whole lot of things. Again, my name is Celso Mata. I am uh, the Chief Building Official here to report on our Building Inspection Department. Our department is, our mission is to ensure the construction of buildings and homes that meet recognized standards for quality of life and building and safety. And it is what we do every day. Our vision comes from our team. It's something that resonates with them, and they came up with working together to build a safe plano. We also had some others that people remember uh, from plans to reality. To accomplish this, though, we, we see ourselves as first preventers. What we get to do is we're going to look at uh, plans for buildings, and we get to look at them for code correctness. And hopefully we're able to find something, if necessary, that can uh, uh, make those plans uh, safe and code correct. And then out in the field, we do the same thing. We have a saying in our industry, and it is that when we do our job well, nothing happens. And so we hope that uh, certainly everyone that uh, is in all the buildings that we live, work, and play in, that nothing's happening except live, working, and playing. We have 40 full-time employees to part-time. Our average is 4.52 customer service. We've been accredited since 2007 through the International Accreditation Service, 
We've been reaccredited five times. Our department is essentially three divisions. We have permitting, plan review, and inspections. Looking at permitting first, permit technicians. So it's our front desk. We have walk-in customers, uh, 17 on a daily average. Email permits, that's kind of flip-flop because of COVID. Um, and we probably will keep that. A lot of people would like to uh, do electronic permits, emailing, take in a lot of phone calls. We have a lot of questions on different things. We also take permit fees, but not just building permit fees. We take them for fire, parks impact, C&D recycling. When the health department's involved, we take their plan review fees and water meters. So we're about averaging 28,000 in a day. Permit technicians also issue permits, and some of them are for smaller projects, pools, spas, fences. And we help people with uh, garage sales and other permits. Plan review, our plans examiners. So our goals for residential plan review are three working days or less. For commercial, it's 10 working days or less. And that is not to receive a permit, but rather for comments. We get a lot of uh, commercial work, and it's uh, increasingly uh, of different building types. And so we also have a duty that plans examiners perform, plans examiner of the day. They get that once in a week. It's on rotation. And what they're responsible for, all the phone calls and anyone coming into the counter, they take all the questions that day. That allows all the other plans examiners to do their work and concentrate on their jobs. Our residential plans examiners, of course, do houses and remodels, but they're also responsible for sign permits. We do a lot of signs. And we've been picking up with solar panels as well. And if we have a Board of Adjustment case, which is a variance request, our residential plans examiners work on that. They will help uh, applicants uh, negotiate the uh, application, and they put together PowerPoint and present to the board. Commercial plans examiners, as you know, of course, handle the commercial work, lots of new buildings, a list of different things there that they would look at. We also do certificate of occupancy permits. Now that would not require any construction at all. Maybe a, a tenant is going to lease a space and paint and, uh, and put in carpet. Uh, but that still requires us to look at, <clears throat> excuse me, look at it. And uh, we also work with the planning department to make sure that the occupancy fits. Inspections, of course, we have building, electrical, plumbing, and mechanical inspectors. And our goal is 100% of our inspections, 24 hours. You call us today, we'll be there tomorrow. We average 14 on a day, that's what our goal is. And we hit about 48,000 at this time. You can call us several times uh, in different ways, uh, online or uh, our voice response system. Or you can text using our select text. A lot of people like to text, and you can do that and uh, use your permit number. We can occasionally do Saturday inspections. We do emergency on-call inspections. Um, and we do digital inspections, which is video. And that came about through COVID. We couldn't get into certain places and certainly uh, um, people's homes. So we, we still went out there, but the contractor would help us with video. We also pick up signs, illegal bandit signs that may perhaps be in the right of way. Almost 6,000 we picked up. We investigate citizen complaints on the calls sometimes. And we also look at alcohol beverage permits. And we measure the distance requirements uh, to uh, about 300 feet to a, a school uh, or hospital or church. We enforce the international codes and uh, NFPA 70 National Electric Code. You can see these are the 2021 codes, but we are under the 2018. But we hope to bring this to you next year, January or February timeframe. We hope to get to the 2021. 
We have other ordinances that we enforce as well, lighting ordinance and construction. There may be a photometric study required, which will evaluate the lighting sources of, say, a parking lot for spillover. Sign ordinance, we issue permits for signs, as you know. Noise ordinance, which was recently uh, uh, at council. Uh, we see a lot of buildings now, uh, high rises and other uses that want uh, generators. And so we need to look at that as uh, far as the noise ordinance is concerned. And then we have certain aspects of the zoning ordinance that we enforce as well, not just use and occupancy, but the exterior of a building and what it, uh, what it is made of. Here you can see some of our uh, people in action. We've got plans examiners there, inspectors. We also have a uh, outreach project where we work with the Collin College Technical in their architecture and construction management program. They've asked us for different site visits occasionally through the years, and we've, we've done that working through our chapter, our Building Officials Association of Texas. Some numbers to look at. We have uh, in commercial finish outs about 512 permits for the year. Residential alterations, we're down a little bit there. We are at 188 for this year. Houses, single family residential, we're at 308. And inspections, we, we've talked about that. That's right at 48,000. Waived fees, we take permits, but then there are some that we waive the fees for. Those are government projects, of course, our own. Uh, Collin College, any state of Texas or federal government, uh, DART. Those are some examples of some of the projects that we are going to waive fees on. And our permit fees that came in this year, we came in right at 6.2 million. As you know, we're responsible, Building Standards Commission. We have uh, substandard cases, or we, this year, had to review the codes. So we had 11 uh, total cases this year. We're also responsible for Board of Adjustment, which are variances, as you know, uh, sign variances, zoning. We also had one reasonable accommodation. Seven total cases this year. Of course, certainly not all, but wanted to list some projects that we do have under construction right now. Granite Park 6 was recently released, and they have just come out of the ground just now starting. We've got several others there listed, very large projects. One of the more interesting ones is Bank of America, which is solar panels. They are covering the entire uh, campus, basically, right at 400,000 square feet. And in plan review, we have several jobs still in, in plan review. <clears throat> the HEB, as we're all familiar with, should be out by the end of this week, we hope. If not, it'll be next week. We've been working on that, so that's something we're looking at. And uh, we can see some other projects that we have there that are still in plan review. Some projects and opportunities. We are looking at our, dis our disaster response team and trying to put together working with GIS and emergency management and uh, targeting of software that we can use if in fact we have to send our inspectors out after a uh, disaster, uh, something that just occurred unfortunately in, in Kentucky and in that area. So we wanna be ready for that. And we've already met a couple of times on this. We want to continue digital inspections and expand on that. We have a homeowner video series that we have on our website, and it is uh, videos that we got help with with, with our, uh, our department that uh, I just forgot, community services. And uh, it's uh, water heaters. We've got accessory buildings. We've got fences. And we're looking at uh, insurance services organization, which will be coming in this week, in fact, to look at how we... Uh, do uh, have our building code effectiveness and how we uh, have enforcement. We are also uh, working with a consultant to improve our work processes 
And that is a report and a draft that we have right now. It should be ready in the coming weeks, probably in the next two weeks. And of course, our 2021 code adoption. Some uh, future department activities as we come out of COVID and we think we're gonna be able to do this is builder's luncheons. We wanna get back to that. We usually have three in a year. Department retreat, we hope to have that again. And uh, building safety months, of course, in May. And we wanna continue uh, with Collin College Technical Education. And at this time, I'm open for any questions. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Sal. So I have a uh, question and a comment. Um, what const first, the question, what constitutes bandit signs? Is that any sign that's not permitted, like yard sale signs, open house signs, temporary things as well? Well, I think uh, getting there real quick, it would be yes, any of those signs, if they're placed in the city right-of-way, which is always the struggle. Uh, it's uh, basically you go from sidewalk to sidewalk and anything in the street. So that would be, uh, sometimes it's garage sale signs or someone selling something and just stick them out there on a pole and we just pick them up. Okay, and the comment, um, I don't have to apply for uh, permits very often, thankfully. Uh, somebody I know who does in a variety of cities uh, told me that he recently had to get a permit in Plano and it was a fantastic process compared to the process he goes through in other cities. So that's a great testament to you and staff. Well, I'm really glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still looking forward to see what the consultant has to recommend. <laughs> Thank you. Councilman Grady. I mentioned that I circle almost every item in your report, so I've got a lot of questions. Um, tell me what we're doing with Collin College. Okay. That is through our chapter, and it is, uh, we've been talking to the instructors, as you know, they, through the years, they have achieved even building a technical college campus out there, a uh, technical building. And so a lot of things come from the, uh, in the last six, seven years, the trades and everyone uh, abandoning uh, what we do because of what happened with the economy. And so it's a comeback. And so as a part of that and everything else that they do from each of the trades, they realized that they were not really strong on the codes. Didn't have any code classes. So what can we do? They went to our chapter and uh, Plano being closest to the campus, it's in Allen, uh, they asked if we could site visits occasionally and that was a picture of one of them that we've been to we've done that a few times uh, we also have they also have a curriculum uh, of uh, code uh, chapters and different things in a book and uh, different cities and building officials are working with them to do that i will be doing one two of them begins in january for the next session and we've We've already, this is our second year doing that. So it's, they liked it and they want us to come back. And so we, uh, we just, we're just involved. That sounds like a great program that you're doing. Um, one other question I had a legislative session um, some time ago uh, took a lot of the controls of the types of materials that are used within the city and, and removed those controls. Um, has that made um, inspections more difficult, less difficult? Has there been issues with that? I, I think you're talking about uh, House Bill 2439. Um, it, it's, um, well, we just have to pay more attention to what that plan of view and the different things that are going on. Uh, we also have in the codes right now as we're adopting them, uh, we have amendments from the Council of Governments and amendments can uh, be more stringent, but we also have certain Plano amendments. And there were certain things with the fire department and the building department that we, uh, years before this house bill, uh, were able to amend out of the code. We can't do that anymore. And so uh, that's been a, uh, something that we've adjusted to. 
a lot of the inspectors are used to things that we used to do on that, and we, we've, uh, we've adjusted and made the change. So we're, we're going to have, uh, when we adopt the 2021, it will uh, observe House Bill 2439, which, of course, we have to do. Well, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Just following up on the question from Council Member Grady, have you noticed any trends in the um, developments or buildings that are going up, a, a decrease in the quality because of that bill? I would say no. Um, there's a lot of good uh, contractors out there and architects, and you can build a building out of a lot of uh, good materials. I think that uh, hearing from other cities, um, there are some that are going to have a strategy to combat that bill in the next session, taking pictures of houses that are next to certain homes that may be of, say, made out of brick, and then the house next door is not. And you can, you know, make it out of a metal, uh, do just full siding or different products. And so the look is not there and the different things that that uh, can do to a city that uh, had a certain uh, requirement before. And so that's what I've heard. And uh, I think uh, that's where we'll see things uh, that change. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. The next item is discussion direction regarding a grade update rebate tax abatement for residential and commercial properties. Uh, this discussion is also has a uh, presentation from Lori Schwartz, Director of Neighborhood Services. So why don't we uh, start with you, Lori? Mayor and Council, before Ms. Schwartz gets started, this was a, an item that was posted by two council members with regard to the possible expansion of uh, abatement or abatement-like activities to uh, other properties in the city. And one of the things that came up was the great update rebate. So we thought it would be uh, advantageous to refresh council's memory on what is going on with the great update rebate, which is obviously run by uh, Lori Schwartz and her team. So thank you, Lori. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to apologize. I have a slight cold, so if I cough, I brought some water. But um, just wanted to give you a quick overview of the Great Update rebate and just a reminder of sort of how this program got to be. Um, this was initially created back in 2014, so it's been a program for the last seven years. It was really intended to support redevelopment into our moderately priced older neighborhoods. As you can see, we're looking at 35 years or older, um, and it is is indexed off of the FHA single family mortgage lending limit. And the reason we did that was just to have a uh, index to reflect our changing market values within our community. To give you an example of how significantly this has changed since the program first began back in 2014, the house value maximum in 2014 was $200,000. So we have adjusted by 150,000 over the last seven years. So this uh, is a map that shows you the applications that have been received to date over the last seven years. As you can see, we've received almost 1,000 applications. Um, looking at total investment into Plano neighborhoods, we're at 30, almost $32 million, um, with Plano uh, investing 4260000 and Plano property owners investing $27,642,000. Um, looking at the different colors that you see on the map, the orange is the predominant color, and you will see that that is primarily housing that is built in the 1970s. So you'll see that that is the, the predominant uh, decade of construction that we see with the great update rebate. This is showing you the 2021 eligible properties, um, which is that maximum value of right under $350,000. Um, every year we see adjustments to the properties that are eligible depending on age of structure as well as their appraised value. 
This map here shows you the change of the appraised value and the age of structure that happened last year. If you look at the blue um, on there, you can see that those are the ones that were added, and so those are usually uh, due to age, so there's about 50 added. However, we lost about 2,200 eligible properties due to their appraised value going above the indexed rate. So just some uh, overview of some things that have changed since we started the program. Uh, one thing was our initial time period to complete the project has been expanded. This has been primarily due to COVID. Um, if uh, you have done any construction over the last two years, you know that there are supply chain issues and there are some challenges uh, just with being able to get contractors. And so we are working with our residents to try and expand that time period. The other thing I wanted to point out is, uh, for, at least for the last three years, we run out of money routinely before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, typically, it's either late third quarter or early fourth quarter when we run out of uh, funds, and we end up with a wait list, typically of about 100 residents waiting to be part of the program, which makes us start the next fiscal year that we're funded under um, immediately have to, to kind of handle all of those folks that are waitlisted. So we almost started a little bit of a negative at the beginning of each year because we have so many people waiting to become part of the program. And Lori, really quick, uh, Council, the term encumber basically means we're committed. So think of it as a check that you've written, but it hasn't been cashed yet. So we've encumbered funds is basically us making a commitment within the program to make sure that those funds are available for a particular project. Right. So I just wanted to make sure. And just as a, a, a quick aside to that, um, sometimes, you know, what we encumber funds is they're presented. And sometimes when they are going through their project, it might end up being less that we would have a rebate, or sometimes they hit the max of that 5000 So towards the end of the year, we're, we're in a, a fair amount of flux as we try and close out projects. So, but that's generally the time for encumbrances. Um, and then just last, I'm not sure if everybody uh, knows that we have a multifamily rehabilitation rebate program. Um, this was funded um, several years ago um, using a one-time cost um, of $206,000 from um, a non-revenue source, um, a property tax revenue source. It is focused on external repairs only. Um, looking at triplexes or larger, they have to be 15 years or older, um, and they have a separate uh, minimum investment by the owner of 10,000 if it's 20 units or under, or 21 units or over, it's a $25,000 investment. We've had nine uh, multifamily complexes across the city take advantage of this program, so you're seeing a, home, a property owner investment of over a million, with the city putting in approximately 130,000. Um, we do have funds remaining in this program to assist about four additional multifamily, and we market to them regularly at the beginning of each year. So that is the end of my presentation. So I'm available if anyone has any questions um, specifically before you start your discussion. Councilman Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Laura, uh, just a quick question for you. Because uh, we've been doing this for a while now, have we taken a look at uh, what the increase in property values for the homeowners have been since these rebate uh, programs have been divvied out to them and they've done the work, uh, you know, how, what has that done? Are they getting more back out of it, I would assume, than I what they put into it? I think it probably depends on what's going on in the market of that particular neighborhood. So it's not a one-for-one one in looking at the neighborhood. Um, what we've seen is, is that um, you will see more likely the thing that's going to affect their appraised value being the sale of properties within that neighborhood. A lot of these folks are... Um, usually staying in their homes. Some of them are more visible um, to mm -hmm. appraisers than others. Um, some of them are interior uh, work. And so at, we've not specifically sat down and done you know, a one-by-one -one evaluation of every single one, but when we've talked to, um, we have touched base a lot with the realtors. Um, it's been a couple of years since since uh, pre-pandemic, but um, under trying to understand how this program assisted, and I don't think we're seeing it immediately send that appraised value forward. It tends to be more what's going on with the housing around, and if they sell, um, they could add to that higher appraised value cost. So that could be a consideration as you think about that. And, and you just touched on my second question I, I had in mind is, is, I think as I recall, initially it tended to be more external 
re repairs and fix-ups that were being done. Do we, are we see that in continue or is it more it's, doing interior renovations? It's, it's both. Um, so we do more highly rebate the exterior repairs. We mm -hmm. rebate the exterior repairs at 25%. Interior rebate is at 10%. So, um, but most of our projects are a mix of the two. Good. Well, I'm very glad that we're still doing it, and mm -hmm. maybe at the appropriate time we can I'll talk about funding a little better so we don't run out of money before the end of the year. Thanks, Lord. Councilman, actually, this is the appropriate time to, to make suggestions along those lines. I think as we're considering um, options and alternatives to be able to uh, spur investment in properties, which I think was, uh, I don't want to speak for Councilman Williams, I'll let him speak for himself, but uh, along those lines, if we are looking to uh, increase investment uh, in other properties, this would be a, a great time for that discussion. Um, uh, thank you. Quick question, Lori. The 4.2 million figure that you uh, showed for Plano's investment, mm -hmm. was that year to date or program to date? That would be, I believe, year to date. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, those are the like, questions I have. I got a lot more to say, but that was the clarification I needed from Lori. Oh. <clears throat> I can keep talking at length. Well, I'm going to ask her a question. So, Lori, um, based on um, the age of Plano, do you anticipate that there are going to be more and more houses that are going to come up to the, um, I guess, the, the, the age limit in which they would be eligible for um, some type of uh, rebate for the the program that currently is being run? Well, as I mentioned, it, uh, some of this is fluid because of, I, I think if you're talking about age, yes, they would be more likely to be part of it. Um, but when you talk about appraised value, as I mentioned, we've had some loss as well. Um, and so depending on where our market stays long term, that may have an effect of how many properties are eligible for this program versus not eligible for the program. A couple of years ago, we actually talked about um, with council whether we needed to adjust um, that index. And we did adjust the index back at that time. When we first started the program, we were at 70%, and then we adjusted to 85%. So one of the questions came down is, should we consider going to 100% at that time. And at the time, council decided to go to 85%. So depending on how our market changes, we could consider changes like that to index it um, you know, one for one on the, the index that was chosen instead of a percentage of that index. But what about um, the, the uh, price of, or the value of the house in in you know, looking at what's going on right now in the housing market, um, all, all, all houses are going up. In, in, mm -hmm. in, and so um, do you think that a possible consideration with regard to adjustment of that um, also need to be considered? I think that's something you certainly could consider. It was something, as I mentioned, that was discussed a, a couple of years ago in reflection of the market changes that we were seeing. I don't think we had an anticipation at that time that we were still going to continue to see the market increasing the way it has. Um, so that certainly could be something to consider. But if you do that, we are going to be opening up more properties. And as I've mentioned, we're already running out of money before the end of the fiscal year. So I would say if you decide to increase the number of properties that were eligible, you would probably need to look at whether or not that funding needs to be reviewed as well. Well, I, I think, Mr. Mayor, that I think we probably um, should look at a possibility going towards that direction um, based on the fact that Plano is, a lot of the houses are getting older. And, you know, I, I just think that funding, if we maintain the same, is not going to be good enough to cover some of the um, aging houses that's going to gradually come up into our um, our city. Okay. Councilman Williams, did you? Oh, uh, are there any other questions? <clears throat> well, I don't know. Is, is there any consideration at all as to the financial <clears throat> situation of the homeowner, or is it strictly so we don't weigh yeah. out the, the need Right. At all for no. assistance. No. Um, we still have our rehab program, which deals with uh, homeowners that are 80% or below of the area median income. Um, and when we looked at this 
program to start a couple of years ago, we were really hoping to be able to support residents that were in the 80 to 120 of AMI. Um, and so, you know, but honestly, we, we have very, we don't look at their finances at all in that respect, except for wanting to make sure that they are up to date on their taxes. Um, and so what we have seen is, is that we get a wide variety of people. This is often an option for them to be able to do needed repairs um, and, and get that rebate because it is very difficult to maintain older homes over time. Um, and so I don't think that in looking at the way the program was set up, it wasn't intended to have the income limits. And sometimes we do see investors come in, which they will then flip the house. Um, and so that provides for people that maybe don't want to do the construction project, the ability to buy a rehabilitated home that they can purchase that meets current market demand. So we tried to be very, very flexible with the program development. Um, and you know, I think we can continue to have that conversation, but it's worked very well over the last Last seven years and remains one of our most popular programs. Yeah, I spoke with a couple of individuals over the last week who are having issues, of, as are most homeowners with homes 30 years and over with mm -hmm. cast iron plumbing, having to, to improve yes. that or replace that. And when you've got someone that's a senior on fixed income in their home, I don't believe that covers, is that, that's not covered in the plan, is that correct? I believe that you can have the, the that can be part of your program. It's it just be. considered, I believe, an interior cost. Yes, it's an interior cost. So it would be a 10% rebate, not a 25% rebate. So there's very few things that are excluded from the grade update rebate. Um, the few that are primarily um, excluded would be like putting in a brand new pool. Um, putting in um, new accessory structures, um, doing certain kinds of things like that. Um, but if you want to repair a pool, that's part of it. But we just we have to look at it um, carefully as far as like what's what is going to be the overall uh, value to the home and to the market. We don't want to incentivize additional pools being built, but we do want to incentivize having people repair the pools because those are significant problems long term for expenses. Absolutely. Yeah, I would like to consider us looking at including plumbing as a, a exterior feature because it is such an expense and re a required one. It's not um, aesthetics or anything like that. It's something mm -hmm. that has to be repaired. So that's something I would like to see included at the 25%. Okay. Councilman Riccadell. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. So. Uh, uh, Part of what I was going to ask about came up in the discussion with Council Member Holmer. I was going to ask if people who are uh, flipping houses are eligible for the program. It, it sounds like they are. Do we have uh, an idea of what percentage of the funds are going to owner-occupied houses versus uh, a it house flipping? It was very low. Okay. Um, last time I remember was checking, it was about 10% investor occupied okay. or investor e properties investor versus owner-occupied. Okay. Thank you for that information, mm -hmm. Lori. I appreciate that. Um, there are actually two very loosely related things I'd like to discuss as part of this uh, topic. The first was the idea of, and I probably should get away from this nomenclature, but tax abatements for all. Uh, the reason I said tax abatements is because it's something that uh, everybody, at least on this council, can relate with because we do it with large projects, um, uh, developments, relocations, etc. Now, for that, the principle at play for me is that when we, when we issue a tax abatement, whether it's for building a brand new campus like Toyota did on what was a green field and had very low property taxes when it was just a field comparatively, or uh, something like the concrete development we're revitalizing, they always go towards something very large. <clears throat> and it makes intuitive sense to me because the amount of money they would then be paying in property taxes for making improvements on that property far exceeds the additional cost to the city in terms of resources um, in those cases. So again, to take Toyota, for instance, we had to make an investment as a city in um, you know, traffic lights, some infrastructure, not anything on a par with what they would then be paying in property taxes. So when the property tax burden would exceed, especially far exceed, the increase to the cost of, uh, in the cost of city services, I believe it's right to not punish that developer, property owner, et cetera, for making the improvements to their property. Whether it's a formal tax abatement or not is totally immaterial to me. Whatever is legal and easiest. 
However, the issue I have is not that it's offered to them, but I would like to see that same thing offered to everybody else, uh, home, individual homeowners, small businesses, et cetera, because we have truly a perverse incentive to not improve your property, at least in the eyes of the Central Appraisal District. So I'm gonna use a personal example, and I, it's, it's a little bit ironic for this, that, uh, for this um, example that the great update rebate uh, does not uh, put money towards swimming pools. So I had a swimming pool put in at my old house in East Plano, uh, should never have done it, spent gobs of money and then moved a year later, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but I digress. My property taxes, because you know, the central appraisal district can see the satellite view and say, hey, you put in a pool, your taxable value went way up. So I got, I got reamed with new property taxes. <clears throat> so if the city had given me $5,000 in the great update rebate, to put in a new pool, it would have received three times that much over the period of 10 or 15 years in what it had given. Um, however, for people who are conscious about being taxed more in increasing their property taxes, they have that disincentive to improve their own properties and I find that backwards. I mean, a lot of people know that uh, I believe the Texas property tax system has long outlived its usefulness, uh, but for the moment, that's what we have and I would really like to explore ways, creative ways, to properly incentivize homeowners to, and property owners, business owners, to make improvements to their property, which um, increases the livability of the city, increases the overall property value of the city, uh, but without punishing them with increased taxes when it doesn't actually increase our costs to provide city services, or at least no more than our increase to the cost of city services. Um, so whatever legal mechanism or form that takes, that's what I really wanted to accomplish. Um, secondly, as it pertains to the great update rebate um, specifically, I, in, in fact, the mechanism by which we're providing funds for the great update rebate um, might be a, an efficient thing. It might be the most efficient thing. Um, <clears throat> but where it pertains to exter exterior improvements, which could reflect in an increase in the taxable value of a home, I got no problem with it. When it comes to interior improvements with some of the examples that have been raised, um, uh, and I've looked, I'm looking at the list, included in that are uh, new sinks, um, new countertops, uh, kitchen countertops, various things. Some you can say are absolutely crucial to a home, some not so much, but in all cases, if they're on the interior, the taxable value of the home isn't gonna go up unless the home is sold. And in that case, the money that they're getting is a handout, a taxpayer funded handout. I have no doubt that the people benefit from that. Anybody's gonna benefit when you give them free money. Um, and I understand there are certain requirements in order to receive that money, but there's nothing commensurate to offset an increase in property taxes. And many of these repairs are part and parcel to home ownership. Now, I was speaking with Councilwoman Homer earlier, and she raised the very valid point that there are people in uh, very old houses, um, some of whom are retired on a fixed income, and when major repairs come along, like many people are ha experiencing in the aftermath of Snowmageddon, um, they have very few options. And I think a community fund and anything we can do as a city to help facilitate awareness and uh, maybe creative legal mechanisms to help people provide things in a community fund, I'd write a check tonight to help people in lieu of the great update rebate, which ultimately is tax dollars, something which people don't have an option to provide, don't have an option to pay. So it would be a massive overhaul, but I would like to see the aspects of the great update rebate that do not result in a higher tax burden, property tax burden, um, done away with or at least phased out in favor of the things that um, do increase somebody's property tax burden to help offset that property tax burden when we as a city don't have to fork over extra resources in terms of city services. Um, so there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, there are a lot of concepts there and I have no illusions that this is a very quick discussion, but I, I may be dressed like Santa Claus, but I'm very cognizant of spending uh, taxpayer dollars on things that don't actually benefit the broader community, um, but individuals specifically. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor Pro. 
I, one thing I like about the great update rebate is that you get a lot of data so that you can see how much is being invested and where in Plano. Um, so I think that's very helpful for us to see that there is a lot of money going back into homes in our city. Do you have any other data or do you have the ability to get other data to see um, or maybe just anecdotally thoughts on how many um, other properties may be being invested in throughout the city? So are you talking about people that would technically be part of the great update rebate but are not taking advantage of the great update rebate? Yeah, how many, or just um, to the point of investors that are coming in and investing in homes, because he made the point that he thought people are, um, you know, they are de-incentivized to do um, updates to their house. And so I'm just wanting to know, do we have any data that proves that that's true? I mean, I had heard um, over the last year that a lot of people were investing in their houses because they were saving money from COVID and other things. Mm -hmm. And so they were home and they were putting money into their houses. So I'm, I'm just wondering if we have any data to show one way or the other. The only, th I can say anecdotally, um, what I have heard from people is, is that actually having the great update rebate helps people make a decision to invest in Plano in an older home instead of looking to a newer home in an adjacent community. So I think the, the thing that we have to think about long term is neighborhood stability um, and neighborhood reinvestment. And so if we want people buying into our homes, we want people to have an incentive to improve those homes, whether they are buying into it or staying here. Um, you know, having the homes that are, that I can think of several recently where people have made a choice to spend money in Plano um, and to live in Plano because we had this program available. Um, as far as, I have not heard any disincentives as far as like investing in their homes at this point. Um, you know, not all of the interior things that um, Councilmember Williams mentioned require a building permit. So, you know, those things might be happening without us ever seeing that kind of investment on anything through the city. Um, and so, some of those things we would not actually even know we we're having the investments if they didn't have those kinds of requirements. And it could be carpeting or um, cabinetry. Um, it, obviously, if it has electrical, plumbing, those things have to get a building permit. Um, but there are some things that are cosmetic on the interiors that don't require building permits. But I can't think of anything that I have heard recently um, about disinvestments um, for putting money into the homes. And, and please don't misunderstand. It wasn't to say that um, the, the additional property tax for exterior improvements that presents a barrier to people improving their homes is just a disincentive. Obviously, lots of people are still investing in their properties, like I did building that uh, foolish pool. So I know we need to wrap this yeah, up. Yeah, Anthony, if you could be pretty quick with your comments or questions. So we can... Uh, <clears throat> We we'll, we'll get some we'll direction do. real quick. A a absolutely. So I just wanted to say that, uh, Lori, you gave the answer earlier that we're not seeing an increase in taxable value when people make these improvements. I, I was surprised to hear that. Uh, like Council Member Williams, I agree with moving, removing a perverse incentive to not improve your house. The idea was not to punish people who are making improvements to their homes by increasing their taxes for doing so, but it sounds like this is not happening. So I personally don't think any changes are needed. If we make changes, uh, I don't think we should increase funding to the program. Uh, as we all know, city costs are, are going up like those for everyone. There's inflation, building materials are becoming more expensive. I suspect the next budget cycle will have hard choices to make. Uh, so I think that at least, uh, at least without waiting until making it part and parcel of the next uh, budget process, I think an increase in funding could prove unwise. If we make changes, I'd like to look at things like uh, owner-occupied homes uh, versus, uh, you know, house flipping operations, um, prioritizing even further external repairs because that, that creates more of a public benefit than an internal repair, um, indexing uh, potentially if we went to less than 85%. We might not run out of money, you know, three quarters of the way through the year. And uh, to Council Member Holmer's point, those who, who need it most might might receive it. Uh, and uh, and toward that end, we could also look at some kind of income criterion. But those are just my thoughts on it. So I think the direction that we're we're hoping for, and uh, I can get Councilman Grady. Um, there's just a couple of things that I think I would like to see if we're okay. going to be studying this area, and I think that they're important. We have not discussed. Um, 
first i understand that if you do major construction on your home um, the central appraisal district will understand that and will uh, uh, change the value of your home therefore if you drop a large twenty five thousand dollar pool in your backyard it's going to change the value of your home my neighbor who added on an addition to his home and changed it from a three bedroom to a five bedroom changed radically the structure of the home and therefore the value of his home went up and that goes into the appraisal work other things like me remodeling a master bath probably doesn't but if we're going to be able to to really do this i think we need to to divide out the discussion and by, by that, I mean that we have these rebates that we're talking about, and we also slurried into this tax abatements. To me, tax abatements are a different topic, and that is we give tax abatements to large corporations to move their headquarters here so that we have long-term and gainful employment. And that's what we're attracting into the city, which is the reason we do the tax abatement, is to bring in long-term employment for our citizens. The other thing that I think what we really need is we need a financial model on this. If we're going to be doing anything of this nature, it either is going to cost us something, and if it costs us something, then that money has to come from somewhere. And typically that would come from the taxpayer side, because it's not being printed by the city of Plano. And therefore we need a financial model to really understand where, if, if we're going to increase funding, where is it going to come from and how much is it going to cost? And I think that that is really, um, something that we we have glossed over in this entire discussion is I would like to if we say the phrase I would like to see everybody be able to take advantage of this how many millions of dollars is that going to cost because it's got to come from someplace um, and so that's that's a, a major concern of mine so I think we'd need a, a financial model uh, on that as well and and finally I, I just want to mention there are some tax abatements that are given for example like at the Collin Creek Mall they didn't bring in major long-term employment other than the structures that are going to be put there like hotels, retail, restaurants, uh, various other things will create an employment zone. And so therefore the, uh, the tax abatement works in that type of, of arrangement in order for them to construct what they're constructing. If I, if I remodel my master bathroom, I'm employing somebody for a very short period of time to do that, but I'm not creating long-term employment. So that's what okay. I want to say. Re real so. quick on Collin Creek Mall, just to make sure we're all on the same page. It's a tax reinvestment zone that's coming back in rather than an abatement. I just want to make sure we're using some nomenclature. I just want to make sure we're clear that that's a reinvestment zone. And I see Peter nodding his head, which helps me to know that I'm correct. So let's, let's end the, the discussion with, is there a way you can come up with some scenarios that that looks at 100%, 85, 70%. Mm, yes. And obviously give us the ability uh, next month or the month after to be able to evaluate this and not be arbitrary like we're being right now because we have Actually, no idea so what Mayor, that would be. Mayor and Council, before we get to, to uh, bringing that back, I, I think that the funding side of things is going to be critical and well, allowing this to be part of the budget discussion if we do that would be meaningful because at this point, I think we're from a budgetary perspective, we're running into the same scenario we've run into in previous years as far as encumbrances and, and allocations, correct? Yes. And Lori, you had something else you wanted I to I just share? wanted to mention, um, I know that we have recently discussed the housing trends analysis that was done pre-pandemic. Um, there was a financial model on the great update rebate done pre-pandemic, um, it might be worth it for us to send that back out to all okay. council members that were not here at that time. Um, and then also for, you know, if we're considering a financial model, this might be a good thing to look at updating first because we have a baseline for that. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Is everybody okay with that? Uh, Mayor, just to provide a little clarification as we move forward. Um, <clears throat> I, I think Councilman Grady, Councilman Grady's point about kind of decoupling these two ideas is salient. Um, there are really two different things that are being conflated. On the one hand, if we can explore the financial ramifications of providing some kind of offsetting incentive when people's improvements, businesses, individuals, uh, exterior improvements do result in an increased property tax burden, that completely separate uh, consideration from the great update rebate program, even if they come back together at some point in the future. Is that clear? Mayor and council, if, if we bring that back, I do not have that programmed right now in the city. 
Right. We do not have that skill set. We do not do appraisals like that or assessments like that. Okay. So if we want to bring that back, I'm just cautioning you. We do not have that on staff right now. That will be a completely new program and something that we do not currently have on staff. I don't know how we're going to afford to do that. I, I, I mean, I think appraisal is done by county, right? I yeah. mean, we're, we're, we're city. And, you know, if they have resources over in county that we can um, borrow and look at, that's fine. But I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm with Council Riccadelli. I, I think at this point we, th we should just stay put. And, and and until when budget session it comes bu comes up, then we need to talk. Okay. Could could I ask a question? Um, so we had talked about commercial incentives. Is this something that you want us to be looking into at no. all, or not at this time? No. Not not at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, consent and regular agendas. Uh, any item you'd like to pull, we are pulling item L because there'll be speakers on that. Any other item? Uh, items for discussion on future agendas. Mr. Mayor, I have uh, one that I'd like on a future agenda. I'd like to extend an invitation to Mr. Michael Morris of the North Central Texas Council of Governments. Um, a a uh, transit study has just been completed for Collin County. I think the information is would be great for, useful not only for um, the city of Plano, but for others to hear as well. I totally agree. Thank you. Anything else? We'll begin a regular meeting in three minutes.
declare that the Plano City Council is reconvened in open session, that all members are present. We will begin tonight's regular meeting with the invocation led by Pastor Julian McMillan with Grace Church Plano and the Pledge of Allegiance and Texas Pledge led by, uh, led by Councilman Rick Grady. Unfortunately, Legacy of Harmony could not be here with us this evening. Thank you, Pastor McMillan. Appreciate you being here. Let's all stand. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time we have together this evening. Be with us, God, we need you. I thank you that you are blessing our mayor and his family, and that as you lead him and guide him, your presence is with him. I thank you for our city council members and their families. Strengthen them and empower them. Lord, I thank you for the residents of Plano. Be their hope, be their peace, be their wisdom, and give them health. Lord, I pray for our city that we'll continue to be a safe, vibrant, and sustainable city. Today, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Tonight we have a, the honor and the privilege of recognizing so many of you out there tonight uh, that had a valuable contribution and commitment to the Plano Comprehensive Plan process. Your repre uh, representation helped bring reconciliation to our community and resulted in successful adoption of the 2021 Comprehensive Plan. Thank you for your commitment and dedicated service and we have a token of our appreciation here. We're going to call out a lot of names. So uh, I, I, those of you, just those that I call out, just come on down. And obviously, we have a, a gift for you. Uh, we'll start with the Comprehensive Plan Review Committee. Doug Shockey, Chair. Mike Bronski, Vice Chair. Jeff Beckley, J.C. Crawford, Jim Dillavu, come, come right Aaron Doherty, Carolyn Doyle, Shin He Gong. Larry Howe, Mary Jacobs, Hilton Kong, Salvatore Lamastra, Michael Lynn, Jack Liu, Yoram Solomon and Sarah Wilson. Let's give a big hand to these folks that spent many months putting this together.
I'm going to skip around a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to call the Planning and Zoning Commission next. I'll let you guys get up in a minute. <laughs> Nathan Barbera, David Downs, Bob Gibbons, Gary Carey, Rick Horn, Alan Samara, Arthur Stone, and Gwen Walters. I, I, glad to have you. Hey, Art. Hey, Art. Good to see you. We also had contributions, as always, with our good partner, PISD. Uh, I'd like to ask Sarah Bonzer, Randy McDowell, Teresa Woodward, and David Stolley. Our consultant, Friesen Nichols. Are anybody from Friesen Nichols here tonight? All right. Well, we invited you. I wanted you to know that. <laughs> we'll, we'll send you Christmas gifts. I promise you. But we can't thank you enough for all the work that, that they did uh, during the last two years. As I said, I'm going to skip around a little bit. I'm going to call the folks that really did the, the, the meat of the work for many years and that's the planning department. Christina Day, director of planning. Michael Bell, comprehensive plan manager. Christina Sebastian. Drew Brauner. Reza Sardari. Kelsey Poole. Matt Purvis. Eric Hill. Oh, you're over here. Steve Sims and Lynette Magana. This is the planning department. Let's give them a large round of applause. City Manager Mark Israelson, Deputy City Manager Jack Carr, Deputy City Manager, excuse me, Shelly Seimer, Seimer, oh, Shelly, I did it Greg Russian, Deputy City Manager, Paige Mem, City Attorney, Michelle D'Andrea, Deputy City Attorney, Peter Braster, Director of Special Projects. Sam Drive, Fire Chief. Ed Drain, Police Chief. Lori Schwartz, Director of Neighborhood Services. 
Caleb Thornhill, Director of Engineering, Dan Prendergrass, Director of Public Works, Brian Chusky, Transportation Manager, Jimmy Vargas, Technology Services, Shanna Haley, Director of Communications, Melissa Peachy, Steve Andrews, Al Carnley, <laughs> Evan Reitzel, and Elizabeth Hurley. Oh, they're all in, in <laughs> below. Let's give them a round of applause. Finally, call the city council up, Casey Prince, Maria Tu, Anthony Riccardelli, Rick Grady, Shelby Williams, Julie Holmer, Rick Smith, Harry LaRossiliere, and Lily Bow. Come on down, Lily. Oh, yeah, I guess he didn't come tonight. Ooh, my nose too much. It glows. Absent without leave. Oh, keep it on, keep it on. All right, we got to squeeze it. She's going to be squeezing it. Okay. I'm too tall. Here we go. Move up. I'm working. You're short. Oh, you're right. Here we go. Oh, we're all. Here we go. Like hurting council members. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> With Santa hats. Okay. <laughs> Again, thank you all for being a part of this. Chief, you were, did you come down? Yes, sir. Okay, I was just making sure. <laughs> How did I miss that? Okay, I was, I was on the other side. Thank you all for your participation in this over the two-year period that you were involved. Uh, we, we can't thank you enough, and that's, that's why we have uh, the committees and, and the departments and, and planning and zoning to be able to come up with, uh, with a plan that worked for everybody. So once again, thank you all for being here. Uh, we can't thank you enough for the work you put in. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, comments of public interest. 
Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The council may not discuss these items but may respond with factual or policy information. The council may choose to place the item on a future agenda. And I do have a few speakers this evening. First is Sharon Overall. Sharon Overall, Plano, Texas. I always hear that the rights of smokers are being violated by smoking bans, but the way to look at it is that the rights of the non-smoker has been trampled on over the decades, and it's time for the non-smoker's rights are met. A smoker has every right to smoke on his private property as long as he can contain 100% of the offensive and deadly smoke to not drift across his property line. If you can smell it, you have been assaulted by smoke. When even small amounts of secondhand smoke can irritate another's allergies or cause an asthma attack, it becomes necessary to ban it to prevent the non-smoking citizens of the city, to protect the non-smoking citizens of the city. As stated by the City of Carpentaria Municipal Code, the non-consensual exposure to secondhand smoke and the uninvited presence of secondhand smoke is a nuisance. I have been asked what other cities have stricter smoking bans. Plano is about a decade behind in their smoking bans. Plano should be at the forefront of creating a first-class city and not just following others. But I will state a few of the restrictions. Smoking is widely prohibited in many parks and playgrounds in cities including New York City, Burbank, Los Angeles, Palm Springs, and Charleston, South Carolina. New York City's ordinance also bans it in pedestrian plazas such as Times Square and all beaches. Smoking is banned on sidewalks, streets, and public parks in Waynesville, North Carolina, and Lona Linda, California. Smoking is banned on streets and sidewalks in the city of Charleston's hospital district. Smoking is banned on private patios and balconies and private non-enclosed areas in all attached residential units in Burbank and Pleasanton, California, and also Marin County, California. Carpeteria smoking ban states, smoking is prohibited in all public places in the city where other persons can be exposed to secondhand smoke. Except as otherwise provided by state or federal law, smoking is prohibited anywhere, everywhere in the city, including but not limited to streets, sidewalks, parking lots, etc. The ordinance goes on to say that on private property where it is allowed, that smoke is not permitted to enter adjacent areas in which smoking is prohibited, prohibited by this chapter or by the owner of the adjacent property. To clarify, this means that you have to contain the cigarette smoke to your property and cannot allow it to drift to public property or to your neighbor's private property. The city of Plano needs to ban smoking on all city-owned property, such as sidewalks, streets, right-of-ways, and parks. On private property where smoking is allowed, that smoke is not permitted to enter public spaces or onto the adjacent private property's owners uh, or owned by another person. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Matt Dixon. Matt Dixon, 1824, Burning Tree Lane, 32 resident, year resident of the city. When I was working on my MBAs in graduate school, it was common practice when using facts and statistics to quote sources and relevance. Mr. Grady, in the last city council meeting, you spoke with conviction regarding your facts regarding the PISD, but you gave no sources and you gave no specific relevance. You have no children in the Plano ISD. I have four in the Plano West ISD, the boundary area. I have personally been impacted by the influx and the chaos caused by a huge influx of students in an unexpected way at Huffman and its overall impact on the overall arching boundary areas of Huffman, Centennial, uh, Brinker, and other elementary schools and the corresponding uh, middle schools. So perhaps you could explain to us where this overcapacity, which is probably most likely in East Plano, really has its impact in your discussions because you spoke with such conviction, and you had such good statistics, but you didn't give us the, the relevance as to Haggard Farms, and you never quoted the source. 
Perhaps you could spend a little time, because you are allowed to under the Open Meetings Act, to do that, to give us those facts and to speak with as much conviction as you did at that time. And also, if it's not too much trouble, Mr. Grady, you also make a pretty big wind about your opinions about real estate and real estate development and housing. Perhaps you would be so good as to share just with the public a little bit of your qualifications in this area, your credentials, education, experience, and perhaps just one or two success stories to ensure that the public has confidence in your opinions where people like myself who are well qualified in real estate and have worked all over the world on real estate and technology projects related to real estate in commercial, residential, et cetera, and so forth, could be given a certain amount of confidence that when you speak with some conviction that it comes from a foundation that's worthy. Thank you. There are no other speakers. Thank you. Let's move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from this agenda for individual discussion by a council member, the city manager, or any citizen. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests. Move to approve the consent agenda except for item L is in Lima. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item L. Please vote. <clears throat> motion passes eight to zero. Item L. <clears throat> Sorry. Item L, consideration of an ordinance to repeal ordinance number 2017-12-2, codified as Article 5, Noise of Chapter 14, Offenses Miscellaneous of the City of Plano Code of Ordinances, and replacing it with a new Article 5, Noise of Chapter 14, offenses miscellaneous of the City of Plano Code of Ordinances to allow for a permit process applicable to entertainment venues and to, and to otherwise clarify existing language in the noise ordinance and providing a repealer clause, a severability clause, a savings clause, a penalty clause, a publication date, a publication clause, and an effective date. Thank you. As I said, we had some speakers for this item, so we removed it from the consent agenda. So if we could have those speakers come forward, we'll have two minutes per speaker. The first speaker is Steve Johnson. I think he emailed and said he was unavailable. Okay. So we'll go to Ray Ojeski. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Ray Ojeski. My office address is 201 Main Street, Fort Worth, Texas, 76102, representing Legacy Hall tonight. Council, uh, the existing noise ordinance has language that reads currently, the most restrictive maximum noise level shall apply at the property where the noise is audible. The new language would read, noise may be measured where the noise is audible, or where the alleged nuisance is received. Measurement location may be adjusted where line of sight or elevation may pose a challenge in determining whether a nuisance exists. The existing noise ordinance provides one objective standard by which Legacy Hall's activities would be judged where the noise is audible at the property. The new language creates three objective standards which Legacy Hall's activities might be judged by. One, where the noise is audible. Two, where the alleged nuisance is received. Or three, either where the noise is audible or the uh, nuisance is allegedly received and adjusted for line of sight or elevation. It is unreasonable to impose multiple alternative standards 
on compliance by Legacy Hall by which his activities are judged. The new language should provide for one objective standard by which those activities are judged. The new language will also lead to uneven enforcement of this ordinance. By allowing different points of measurement, the noise may be within the required decibel level on the third floor of a residential tower, but exceed the decibel level on the 10th floor of the very same residential tower. Again, it is unreasonable to put a burden on Legacy Hall to have to comply with these multiple standards. I see I'm running out of time here, folks. Um, we're just asking that you look at the ordinance tonight and consider one objective standard where that measurement will be taken, and then at that point, adjust the language accordingly back to what the original ordinance language read. With that, Mayor, I'll conclude my statements and answer any questions anyone has. No questions. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. The next speaker is Dale Brock. Hi, thank you for your time. I am Del Brock. I'm the director of entertainment for Legacy Hall. We are a 1300 capacity outdoor music venue located at Legacy West. I'd like to share some background on what we've been dealing with uh, in regards to the sound ordinance. We've been hosting concerts every weekend for four years now, and we are fortunate to have the privilege of entertaining 1,000 to 2,000 happy concert goers every weekend. Starting in June 2020, we started receiving complaints from a resident in Winrose Tower. I started Legacy Hall in January and immediately made dealing this, with the sound issues a priority. We worked closely with the Plano PD in measuring levels, measuring the sound levels of the tower, and working on resolving the issue and doing everything we can to keep us within compliance. We monitored the sound levels for every show every night with a decibel meter. We have a $280,000 sound system consisting of 20 speakers, 10 per each side of the stage. For most of 2021, we used only 20% of that sound system. 16 of our 20 speakers were turned off, uh, which led to multiple complaints from concert goers about not being able to hear the vocals. Uh, still, the complaints from the same tower resident continued nightly as they do now. We also added a drum shield, which is a plexiglass shield that contained the ambient sounds from the drums. These are typically used in small indoor venues and rarely used in outdoor settings. We've also since added sound baffles to the back of the stage as well. In May, the Plano Environmental Department clarified that measuring the sound at the property line is the industry standard rather than measuring from a resident's balcony. Plano Environmental conducted a sound study that concluded that we were within compliance and they were made aware of our sound mitigation efforts. After this point, we had zero compliant issues. Then at some point over the summer, we were told by Plano PD that they would again be measuring the sound levels from the complainant's balcony. Once again, we have nightly complaints as we do now. In September, uh, we hired a sound company to rehang and refocus our sound system in an effort to make the sound more directional and contained. The cost for this rehang was $18,000 and we permanently removed four speakers. In January, Sound Image will be creating an acoustic treatment design to install elements of, that will further absorb sound. The cost of the study is $15,000. The installation itself will likely cost between thirty dollars and $60,000. Um, I'm telling you all this just to impress upon you how seriously we have taken uh, compliance within the ordinance and how much we appreciate the possibility to apply for a new permit that will grant some exemptions and a little more freedom and allow us to continue to provide live music to the people of Plano. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Weldon Newsom. Uh, my name is Weldon Newsom. I live at uh, 7901 Windrose. It's the Windrose Tower. Uh, I'm not the one that has been complaining that he's referring to, but it's not an individual, but we have two or 300 people in the building and it's a significant problem for all of us. And uh, we can't even hardly enjoy our balcony and it's even very loud inside on Saturday and uh, Friday nights. And uh, one provision in the uh, L will allow uh, Legacy Hall to uh, 
play the loudest music up until midnight. And, uh, you know, 10 o'clock is already a burden, but to extend it uh, is, uh, would make it loud even longer. Legacy Hall is a building that surrounds the sound stage so that if you go outside Legacy Hall on the street at 7800 Windrose, uh, it's not near as loud there because the sound is captured and, and magnified up right toward our residential tower. So it's actually louder uh, on a lot of our balconies and even inside than you would notice just walking along the street. So uh, that's one uh, problem with it. The other one is uh, I think our building is about 250 feet from Legacy Hall, and I, I know it allows uh, application within 100 feet. Well, the sound carries much further than 100 feet. Uh, I thank you for allowing me to speak on it. Thank you. The next speaker is Jerry Kendrick. Good evening, Mayor and City Councilman. Um, my name's Jerry Kendrick. I live at the Windrose Towers. And uh, I'd like to open with a, a sincere thanks for your service. I know a lot of times you get more abuse than praise, and it takes a lot of time out of your schedules. I appreciate that. I also appreciate hearing of the corrective efforts that Legacy Hall has made. However, having said that, uh, I still would strongly encourage you to not modify the noise ordinance. Uh, it, it appears to me that there's several problems with it. It permits a 10 decibel increase from 10 p.m. to midnight on Friday and Saturday nights. Well, it's only a 10 decibel increase. How bad can that be? Here's how bad it is. A 10 decibel increase is perceived by the human ear as a doubling in volume. So you will be doubling the volume permitted from 10 p.m. until midnight for several hundred families. Um, the other thing, as near as I can tell, is that it provides no functional enforcement mechanism and puts the responsibility for measuring and storing volume data on the permittee. That's kind of the definition of the fox guarding the hen house. Uh, the other thing is that if we need to call and make a complaint, the Environmental Health and Sustainability Office, after 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, answers with a recording machine. They can't help us when the noise is at the worst. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate your consideration of this and hope you would take into account the, the residents uh, that live in that area. Thank you. Joanne Kendrick. Hello. Um, thank you very much for allowing us to speak. Thank you, Mayor and uh, the council member for hearing us. I'm Joanne Kendrick, resident of Windrose Tower, and I will reiterate what my husband just said. The particular emphasis for us is the additional uh, decibel system from 10 to midnight. We tolerate it till 10 o'clock, but to extend this to midnight is just unacceptable and should be really consideration for the residents, many residents that live around, and we would like to have a pleasant way to, to sit on our balconies and to enjoy our homes and not to have loud music, particularly from 12 to midnight. So we'd appreciate very much your consideration to not um, uh, pass this new ordinance. Thank you so much. Um, Justin Adcock. Okay. No other speakers. So, one of the uh, the issues with the ordinance is obviously this is one that has some uh, complexities to it that that 
we obviously going to have to work with. This is a fluid uh, policy or ordinance, uh, and I hope you know. And we'll, we do know that there will be adjustments to it as we move down the road. And so I don't want anybody to think that uh, this is uh, a rigid uh, ordinance that we're not going to reflect uh, opportunities to adjust and pivot when it when it's necessary. So I, I just wanted to make that clear up front. Um, did you want to say something? Uh, sure. Actually, Rachel Patterson, if you could come down, she's our director of environmental yeah. health. I, yeah. I wanted her to provide a couple of points of clarification real quick, uh, just on some of the questions that came up. First was the uh, the standard for location um, for measurement. I believe what we're uh, moving to is um, where the complaint is being registered. Where the nuisance is being received. Correct. The other aspect was if a citizen does have a complaint, they can uh, not just dial environmental health, but there are other resources available to them if they're having uh, an issue. Is that correct? Yes. We um, have been working with the police department on this, and they would respond after hours. Thank you very much. Okay, so based on what you just said about moving to where the nuisance is being received, I'm going back to what the first um, speaker spoke to about um, concerns about unequal and inconsistent application of the enforcement of the ordinance. Do you have concerns about that, or do you feel like um, some of that is going to be rectified? Uh, I don't have any concerns. The standard would be at the property line, but if there are line of sight or elevation issues where we need to get to where the nuisance is actually being received, we have the, we have the um, ability to move away from the property line and up to the elevation where it's actually being received. Councilmember Riccadelli. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, I want to start by saying that it's, it's clear that we have one specific case that, that is of interest uh, you know, to many on both sides of that case, but what we're looking at tonight is an ordinance of general applicability for the entire city, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, what we're creating uh, is, is uh, a process by which somebody could apply for a permit for an exception. We're not, by passing this ordinance, we are not granting anyone an exception from the currently existing decibel levels. Um, so I, I do want to clarify that. I also want to say I think it's critically important that we measure from the property line uh, of the individual complainant as is written in this ordinance. I understand the points that the representatives of Legacy Hall were raising, but as a resident of a single family home in the city, if I was to make a noise complaint, the measurement would be taken from my property line. Uh, that same standard should apply for people living in condo towers or multifamily buildings. Everybody should be entitled to a quiet night's rest at their property line, you know, where they live. And so I think it's, and also um, in this specific case, there are, um, there are buildings in between where lower floors or at the ground level, the decibel level might be lower just because it's not because it's not loud where it's emanating from, but because it's blocked at a certain lower level, but is not blocked at a higher level. And so I, I, I think we would, we would do a disservice to residents if we don't measure it from, from the complainant's uh, property. Um, I can also say there was mention about, you know, the same tower resident uh, making complaints. Uh, I was uh, invited, uh, I, I think because it's in, you know, tec technically in my district in West Plano, to meet with the residents at Windrose Tower. There were about 30 residents at that meeting. They were, they were very concerned about this issue. So I, I, I don't think it would be accurate to make it sound like it's just one individual. And I'd, I'd be happy, by the way, to meet with Legacy Hall as well. But I, I think what we are creating with this ordinance is a process by which we can resolve individual cases like this um, we're not result. We're not giving anybody a permit by passing this ordinance. So I think uh, I think the uh, place of measurement change is a positive one. I think creating the process uh, is wise, and uh, and I, I think obviously this will be one that will be important to dive into. You know when that comes before us as a, as a specific zoning case. Uh, so I would I would favor the the ordinance uh, as drafted. 
Is in fact, right? I'll, I'll be happy to make a motion to pass the ordinance as drafted. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like hold to. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. Does anybody go second that? Okay. Second. Um, I want to get some clarification. I want to make sure um, I understood correctly that in the uh, current, the, the new rewrite of the ordinance, the measurements for any property type or any area of the city would be where the complaint is received. Is that correct? Yes. Not just residential or not just commercial. It's wherever it's received. It's where it's received. It's from the okay. property line where it, the nuisance is being received. Okay. And then um, I didn't notice this, my first read of it, but under the table for maximum specific noise levels in the, the bulleted notes beneath, the last note says noise may be measured where the noise is audible or where the alleged nuisance, nuisance is received. So the second part I get where the alleged nuisance is received, what's, what governs the difference? No, measured where the noise is audible or where the nuisance is received. If it's audible, that doesn't mean it's above the legal decibel threshold. Right. So how, how, how is it to determine where the measurement is actually taken from between the choice of where it's audible versus where the nuisance is received? I think the key is the second <clears throat> sentence there, where measurement okay. location may be adjusted for line of sight or elevation may pose a challenge in determining um, whether a nuisance exists. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, we can, we, can take, we can take a reading from the property line, you're probably gonna hear the noise, but that's right. not where the nuisance is being received. Okay. Thank you. And I, I do agree that uh, taking it strictly at the property line can in some cases be problematic. Um, in fact, we've seen that in areas uh, in the city before. Um, I'd liken it to um, a, 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 an odor nuisance. Um, in fact, there was a really strong smell of burning plastic uh, yesterday morning. Um, but uh, the, if you're downwind of somebody burning tires, I don't know why they'd be burning tires, um, you could detect that at one side of the property and not smell anything and detect it on way away from the other side of the property uh, across the line and be overwhelmed. Exactly. It's the same with noise. Just there are a lot of factors that come into play when we're out there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, uh, I want everybody to know that, that we're very aware of, of the issues here and we're trying to do the best thing that we can for both parties, the business as well as the homeowners. Uh, the, the one thing that, that I can say, and I think the mayor mentioned as well, is, is this is our best effort now, assuming that this passes tonight, to try to, to make it a better situation by being able to uh, measure it at your residence. You know, for instance, uh, that's going to be potentially, potentially better for you. But if this doesn't work, much as we're working on it tonight, we'll certainly be able to, well, willing to take it up again. But what, what I would like to say is being you know, in the audio business, that's my business, that sound typically, as it travels, the dB level actually drops. So you, know, so you may be perceiving it, but the actual level from where it originates is going to be less you know, when it gets over the 250, 300 feet to, <clears throat> excuse me, to, your, to your residence there. But uh, regardless of that, you still, in some cases, perceive that and perceive it as being a problem. I just you know, want you to know that regardless of what we do tonight, it's going to be something that we'll be monitoring. And if it needs to be adjusted at some point in the future, we'll certainly take it up again. So just wanted you to know that. Thank you. I have a motion, a second to approve uh, agenda uh, item L. Does everybody understand the motion? All right, please vote. <clears throat> motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Items for con uh, individual consideration. Public hearing items. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may amend these times as deemed necessary. Non-public hearing items. The presiding officer will permit public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, the length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency, and may include a cumulative time limit. Speakers will be called in the order the requests are received until the cumulative time is exhausted. Item number one, consideration and action to rename the Parkway Service Center 
police substation on Robinson Road, day labor center, and the property located at the southeast corner of 15th Street and K Avenue. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, earlier this year, uh, the city experienced uh, several suggestions from citizens, employees, and uh, even some council members with regard to recognition of a few uh, of the staff members that we here have here in the city of, of Plano, as well as uh, a uh, area of downtown. I requested this, the mayor appoint a naming committee, two council members, uh, to consider the possible renaming of several, several city facilities in a pocket park based on the rec those recommendations, specifically three facilities and a downtown pocket park. Uh, the first uh, item is actually the Pocket Park downtown, which is uh, requested to be Masonic Square. Uh, the Masons have a rich history in Plano, dating back more than 160 years when they first began meeting in the summer of 1860. And on July 24, 2017, the Plano downtown, downtown Historic District was designated as a in the National Register of Historic Places by the National Park Service. Many in Plano are familiar with the Plano Lodge's historic location at 1414 J Avenue. Uh, and the National Park Service mentions an earlier lodge location at 1430 K Avenue, saying a small pocket park is located at the southeast corner of 15th Street and K Avenue and is paved with brick, has a few trees and a boxed hedge. This parcel was once the location of Plano's downtown uh, only three-story building and occupants included a hardware store and a fraternal lodge. Uh, in recognition of the contribution and impact of Plano Lodge number 768A, the facilities naming committee recommended renaming the small pocket park at the southeast corner of 15th Street and K Avenue, the Plano Masonic Square. Item number two uh, is in regard to the day labor center that we have uh, behind Best Buy uh, and in front of uh, the uh, Parker Road Dart Station. Um, Thousands of, thousands of people have been impacted by the work of Adrian Mag... I'm going to say... Um, thank you. I'm, I get it wrong every single time. I'm just going to say Adrian because uh, that's what I called him. He joined the city of Plano as a, member of the, as a member of the planning department in 2007, ending his career with Neighborhood Services Department as the Plano, Plano's Day Labor Center Supervisor. It's not an exaggeration to, to say his work transformed the impact of our day labor center, making it a model for cities throughout North Texas. Our day labor center opened in 1994 due to the demand of temporary labor and the need to eliminate a public safety hazard. And the city, the center provides an organized and safe way for contractors and residents to find temporary work. On a daily basis, the center serves hundreds of people looking for work and Adrian's people skills and management style made laborers feel valued. During the center improvements of 2010, Adrian posted plans on site so the, the laborers could see the changes that were taking place, brought coolers and waters, modified the processes whenever impossible to ensure laborers stayed safe in the heat. This approach to serving all of our citizens was a big factor in why Adrian was named our employee of the year in 2011. Sadly, last year, Adrian passed away. In recognition of his contribution and impact to the city of Plano, particularly for our day labor community, the facilities naming committee recommended renaming the day labor center, the Adrian Magnayanis. Thank you. Magnayanis. Got it. Magnayanis day say. labor center. Third is the Parkway Service Center. Late this, uh, this summer, we tragically lost our la longtime public works director, Jerry Cosgrove. Jerry dedicated his professional life to municipal service, first in Connecticut, then in Texas with the cities of Houston, Denton, and Plano. And he joined the city of Plano in 1998 as our chief engineer. He was promoted to director of public works and engineering in 2010. And from 2011, his role for the remainder of his career focused on public works. He was the consummate professional with brutal honesty and an extensive knowledge of all things engineering. Jerry was not only active in city events, but also with the Texas Society of Professional Engineers and was a public servant through and through and lived our served values. Jerry and his family, Rita and their daughter, called Plano home, and he was passionate about serving the city, his fellow residents, and was an advocate for his employees and always made time for anybody who needed help from him, advice, infrastructure, statistics, or a good laugh. So in recognition of Jerry's contribution and impact to the city of Plano, particularly the Public Works Department, the Facilities Naming Committee is recommending renaming the Parkway Service Center, uh, the Gerald P. Cosgrove Public Works Service Center. 
Sorry, that choked me up for a minute. And then last but not least, uh, the police substation at McDermott and Robinson Road. Greg Russian has served as deputy city manager over public safety since 2019, but he's still known to many of our uh, folks uh, as police chief or just chief. He joined the city of Plano in 1982 and served as assistant police chief from 1996 to 2001 prior to his promotion to chief. He began as a deputy, deputy sheriff in Illinois. He was also an FBI agent serving in Washington, D.C. Uh, during his tenure. But his impact goes far beyond Plano. He's no, held numerous leadership positions, both at the state and federal law enforcement organizations, including past president of the Texas Police Chiefs Association and former executive board member of the IACP. He's a graduate of Leadership Plano, served on both Leadership Plano boards, Plano Youth Leadership Boards, member of the Collin County Children's Advocacy Board, and is currently on their advisory board. He serves the Medical City of Plano Citizen Advisory Board. He's served everywhere. If you're in Plano, you know Greg. Um, and he's also done things with uh, our youth, including being a PISD student mentor, awarding kids their Citizen of the Month, uh, Rotary Club coin at Christie Elementary, and was Weatherford Elementary's Adopt-a-Cop for more than 20 years. And of course, he and his wife are dedicated patrons of the Plano Recreation Centers. In January 2022, Greg will re officially retire from the city of Plano. In recognition of his contributions and impact to the city of Plano, particularly related to public safety, the facilities naming committee recommended renaming the police substation at Robinson and McDermott Road, otherwise known as 802, the Gregory W. Russian Police Substation. And with that, Council, I'm happy to answer any questions. Do I have a motion for the rena renaming of the facilities? Motion to accept the nominations for renaming. So we all second at once? Yeah. Yeah, let's second, second all at once. Second. Yeah. I have a motion and a second uh, to approve item one, which is renaming the facilities of these uh, most honored uh, folks. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Mayor, city manager, city attorney, council, and all of the employees that worked so hard to bring this about. We thank you very much. Jerry strongly believed in public service and believed that the best and the brightest of us should be in public service because public service helped not only the individual citizen, but the community as a whole. Public service is not easy, as each of you can attest to, but it is vital. It's vital for the growth and the health of our community. 
Jerry dedicated his entire public and uh, professional career to public service and to mentoring those who came after him. He would be extremely honored and humbled by what you have done tonight. And on behalf of our family, we want to thank you very much. Thank you so much. Chief and Cindy, please. Council, thank you very much for this honor. It's certainly unexpected. I, too, am humbled by this honor today. And I really couldn't think of anything uh, better than having a substation named after you after working in this profession the number of years that I have. And, of course, having a Plano substation. I mean, the Plano Police Department, as you probably know, is one of the best police departments in the country. And I say that with some authority because I've been on the Texas Police Chiefs Board and International Association of Chiefs Police Board as well. And it's just a great honor for me. But any time that someone's honored, you know, you've got to look at their family. Because in service, you know, it's very difficult. And you need a lot of support in a job like I've had over the years. And my family has been uh, really good through that time and helped me and supported me. Uh, so I'm going to thank my wife, Cindy. Of <laughs> well, <laughs> she's left me here. My wife, of, my wife of 40 years, I might add, we just had our 40th anniversary, and my sons, Robert and Stephen, who obviously aren't here tonight, they weren't aware of this, but uh, I just want to thank you very much. It's a great honor. Uh, Mr. Mayor and City Council members, and especially Deputy Mayor Pro Tem 2 and Rick Smith for listening to me and to our lodge, and Rick Adeli and, and Grady for coming and visiting us on our 125th anniversary. We had a good party that night, as a matter of fact, but I thank you all for for seeing fit to do this. But I would be remiss, Mr. Mayor, if I didn't tell you that most of the honor of this goes to people like Ms. Henderson, Ms. Snyder, who opened up your minutes. You might ought to read those old minutes. They were kind of funny at times. And Ms. Day and her planning staff, uh, Mike Bell, Baresh, and Steve Sims, and also Jack Carr, who came down and also uh, Mr. City Manager, who listened to me for all that period of time. But it is an honor, and we thank you, and let's hope and pray that we can all be here together again 125 years from now. Thank you. Let's take a picture, Bob. I appreciate it. It's our honor. Thank you.
Just gets better. <laughs> Item two. Consideration of a resolution to confirm the appointment of Chris Biggerstaff to serve as Plano, Plano Fire Chief and providing an effective date. Mayor and Council, as y'all are all aware, um, we had uh, the need to fill a fire chief after I once again stole one of our chiefs to bring over to City Hall. Uh, and we're very excited to have Sam Greif join our deputy uh, city manager group. Uh, we had a long discussion about how to fill that fire chief uh, role. We were thrilled um, with the succession planning that's gone on in Plano Fire Rescue and feel after going through the interview process that uh, the best possible candidate who's uniquely qualified to fulfill that role as chief in Plano Fire Rescue was in-house. Assistant Chief Craig, Chris Biggerstaff uh, has been offered the job and accepted uh, the role of fire chief. So I'd like to welcome him down in case there's any really uh, hard questions that y'all would like to ask at this point. Uh, but I'd like to make sure that we introduce him to the community. We are uh, excited. This is the first internal promotion to fire chief that we've had in modern times for, for uh, Plano Fire Rescue. And we're thrilled to be able to say that uh, the talent was able to, to um, grow and develop in-house and is now uh, able to be named chief. So with that, uh, Chief Biggerstaff. He didn't tell me to prepare for the hard questions. <laughs> I just want to uh, say thank you for the opportunity uh, to lead such a great department. I feel like, uh, like Chief Russian said a while ago, I, I believe we have one of the top uh, departments in the country. Um, I said that, I really believe we're the top department, but I, 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 uh, I'm humbled by this opportunity. You know, when you spend 29 years in an organization, uh, you really begin to love the organization and the people in it, and you, you, uh, you realize uh, the value of the support of the city leadership, of our citizens that we've had. Um, I've got some big shoes to fill, but uh, I, we've got a great foundation to build on, and, and, and that's what I plan to do. And thank you again. And his wife, Marcy, is up in the back row there as well, so we want to make sure and acknowledge and her I, as well. I should say thank you to her for the support. And Chief Russian, we just have a 30-year uh, anniversary tomorrow. <laughs> so. Congratulations. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Formality. Please vote. <clears throat> motion passes eight to zero. Once again, congratulations. Item three. Item number three, public hearing and comment. Review of the Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report describing the use of federal funds. This report details how the city used U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development funds during the 2020-21 grant year. The public will be given an opportunity to speak on the report during the public hearing. Well, all right. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Shanette Eden, um, Housing Community Services Manager. It is the time this year where we come and talk about our consolidated annual performance evaluation report. Long name, I'm going to call it a caper. It's what we submit to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. As you can see here in front of you, this past 2020 year was quite an interesting one, but we didn't slow down too much on the work that we provided to our Plano residents. The two main areas that we spent the majority of our funding were in our housing rehabilitation program, as well as our first time home buyer program. You can see the numbers here. Um, when we move on to public service type activities, those are social service in nature. And we provided HUD funds to three organizations, as you can see here on the screen. We um, provided case management as well as, as well as shelter to 26 survivors of domestic violence. Um, Boys and Girls Club was able to still assist in the midst of pandemic. 40 youth that are what we would consider kind of at risk as well as we prevented 416 persons from becoming homeless in Plano by providing them with rent and utility assistance. 
As you know, HUD funds are not enough money. You all graciously set aside $2 per capita every year through our Buffington Community Service Grant funds. We assisted 5,400 Plano residents with those funds. Um, we also used state funding to provide housing to literally homeless through our rapid rehousing program. And then we received emergency rental assistance funding from the U.S. Department of Treasury for those that have been affected by the coronavirus, and we have assisted 635 households. This is a public hearing, um, but I'm also here to answer any questions that you might have of me. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions regarding this? Councilman Smith? Thank you. Uh, should I just curious, uh, I know uh, a lot of people that read the news how the problem is great that, you know, cities have these the federal funds and all distribute. Uh, were we able to give out, especially like rental assistance and all, majority of the funds that we had, or did we have a problem with that as well? We did not have a problem. Um, Plano residents um, were able to ex um, ac access our online application, and um, our ERA-1 funds have been um, expended as of this month. So we'll go into our second amount of funding that you all approved in June, which is ERA-2. We'll start that this month, too. So uh, of the, I guess, was it 400 some? How many folks do you estimate that we're able to prevent from becoming one of our homeless population? So the 416 that you're talking about is our U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development funds. That's our CDBG coronavirus funds. All of those people continue to remain in their homes. Um, there were a few people that were in hotel motels. So of those few that were in hotel motels that we um, kept there, they are um, getting assistance to move out of a hotel motel and to go ahead back into um, having their own residence that they can afford. Good, great. Thank you for the update. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate it. I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers' cards? There are no speakers on this item. And I'll close the public hearing and confine the comments to the council. This does not require this does not require a, a motion. Am, am I right? Am I correct to understand that? You're correct. This was a report that's required by law. You've got it. Thank gotcha. you, sir. So any any other questions or comments before we move on? Thank you very much. Thank you. Item number four, consideration of an ordinance to amend section 2-109 campaign contribution recusal requirement for city council members, article four, code of conduct of chapter two administration of the code of ordinances of the city of Plano, Texas, adding a time limit for recusal requirements for city council members related to campaign contributions, providing a repealer clause, a severability clause, a savings clause, and an effective date. Thank you. So uh, this has come in front of council several times. This is the third or fourth, fourth, fourth time that we've done this. Uh, we've we've kind of gotten an understanding that we're we're going to keep what we have. I think the only thing in question is amount of time, <coughs> whether it be a two two year period or a four year period. But to leave the ordinance as it was this time last year. So that being said, um, we have some speakers cards uh, and uh, we'd be glad to hear from you. But the fact that we've done this four times, we'll hear from you for a minute and a half uh, because we have several speakers. Uh, go ahead and call the speakers and we'll, we'll, we'll get started. All right, the first speaker <coughs> is David Kemp who will be followed by Diana Bisco. Hi folks, David Kemp, 7714 Element Avenue. And I was shocked when this came up uh, because you know I thought that we had put this to bed when we had a, you know, a, a different kind of majority a year ago. And so, it is uh, it's quite surprising to me to think that we're going to put some time limit on donations or what I consider to be bribes. And so I would hope that you guys would move to the four-year 
time limit that's uh, a little more plausible since all of these projects take two years at least. So I would hope that you would move to the two-year time limit so that you can, you know, hold your heads up in public. Thank you. <clears throat> Diana Biscan. Good evening. My name is Diana Biscan. I live at 7714 Element Avenue, Plano 75024. Government accountability is on full display in Plano. And the City Council should pass a strong ethics ordinance to make sure it stays that way. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of the Dallas Morning News article that I read this morning. People are watching. They want to know what we're doing. We're a leader, right? So people are watching. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that we're going to go forward with the ordinance, but I'm confused as to the limit. So you're now saying there's a two-year limit. Well, is there a limit on being honest? Is there a limit on being ethical? Oh, I can be ethical, but maybe a year, maybe two. I'm not really sure what I can guarantee. I just think that's odd that we would have a limit on, well, we can do it this long, but after that, sorry, we're just going to go back to being our old self. So, so I don't exactly understand that. And maybe you'll address it later. So basically, in the words of Council Member Anthony Riccardelli, he said, what remains now is for the Plano City Council to draft an updated ordinance that holds its leaders to what Anthony said, standards of unimpeachable integrity. And we should do that as soon as possible. I thank you. The next speaker is Pat Greer, who will be followed by Ellen Lehrer. Good evening, Council. As I, uh, my name is Pat Greer. I live at 3012 Joe Mar Drive in Plano. I've resided here 40 years. As I understand the current issue regarding the campaign finance ordinance, the discussion revolves along a, a time limit. Instituting a time limit for recusing yourself from a vote on a matter coming before council can be a confusing issue for voters, as most just believe that ethical behavior on the part of our elected officials is their expectation. When money trades hands, there can be the expectation that on the part of some that a favor or service is owed back. This may lead some voters to see a parallel with the large increase in the campaign funds that are raised over the past decade in Plano. With the ordinance in place and a time limit that runs concurrent with the officer, office holder's term, all council members are on the same page. All petitioners of public contracts or development projects also understand the ground rules and don't muddy the waters with inferences or suggestions or special favors. Elections will still have consequences but the public has assurance of the continued and full integrity of office holders. Office holders will focus on making decisions that comply with state and local statutes and keeping Plano an excellent city in which to live and work. Since when did doing the right thing or ethical thing Ms. Greer, have a time time's limit? Up. I'm finished. Go ahead and wrap up. Go ahead. No, I'm finished. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Ellen Lair, and I live on Town Bluff. Um, the Plano City Council Ethics Ordinance, currently two years, needs to be for the full four-year term. A time limit less than the full term renders the ordinance useless. It just means money improperly paid has an allowed time frame. Conflict of interest for half the time is no help. Ethics is two things. 
First, it refers to well-founded standards of right and wrong, standards that impose the virtues of honesty and integrity at all times. Secondly, ethics means striving to ensure that one lives up to high principles and standards at all times. Without ethics, there can be no public trust. Public service officials must act with the highest moral principles, serving the best interests of the city and its citizens at all times. Mayor and council members must act with integrity and honesty and avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety at all times. They must never use their position for personal gain. They must be incorruptible, not just for two years, but for the full term of office. There is no such thing as part-time ethics. Thank you. The next speaker is Lily Bao, followed by Olita Phillips. Good evening, Mayor and Council. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Lily Bao. I was your prior um, colleague. Uh, I'm here to speak just to um, remind everybody, you know, what this ordinance was about. Last year, about a year ago, you know, Councilman Smith and I, we authored and got the support of the Council and passed this. This ethics ordinance was one of the best, you know, ordinances we have passed, especially regarding ethics. Plano has set our city to be a leader by passing this. A lot of other cities look up to us by having this. It is the wrong direction if council decides to weaken it. I mean, in the past, you know, in August meeting, you guys were trying to repeal it, but the good thing happened. I applaud you for that, that you are discussing how to strengthen it. At least that was the message, you know, the council or the mayor has told the public or the media. Uh, saying that the council is considering strengthening it. Setting it to two years is not strengthening it. I would like to remind you, you know, first of all, you know, a lot of the campaigns, usually city council campaigns, took takes about six to nine months. So for a two-year limit, if anybody got into the office starting the term, you have about 15 months left, uh, at most a year and a half. Um, I would also like to remind everybody, not just council, but anybody who's listening, this ordinance does not prevent any candidate, any of you or any future candidates, to receive contributions. It just enables you to receive them with a clean hand and a pure heart. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alita Phillips, a 26-year resident of Plano at 1328 Exeter. Um, I'm wondering, are we really debating this ethics code again? We, we did it, well, now, now, as you've said, for the fourth time. We did it last time this summer. We thought we had it done then. And some of you, I'm, ask, I'm wondering, why are some of you asking for a time limit on the ethics code. Uh, integrity doesn't have a time limit. And if you are asking for that, why? As someone has already asked, you, you plan to be um, uh, above impropriety for a certain time, but after that, you're not sure you can, or you don't, you don't agree to be. What, what's this all about? We don't understand, and that was asked by multiple citizens this, this summer. Not just uh, the few of us who appear quite often. Uh, maybe some of them didn't even know about that this was coming up again. This is uh, very surprising. I was surprised to hear about it. Why does this keep coming up? What is, what is your problem with it? Um, as I said, integrity doesn't have a time limit. I would think that our council members would shun any situation that would cast any doubt on their actions or votes. Uh, hence your integrity. That was expressed by so many citizens, as I just said this last summer, 
and when the issue came up, and plain old citizens should be able to count on your impartiality. Any company that, um, I think I heard that. Ms. Phillips, to... yeah, your time. Go All ahead right. and wrap it up. Thank you. And if those of you who vote for it, we'll, we'll wonder if we need to vote you in again. The next speaker is John Donovan, followed by Robert, Robert Canwright. Okay, so I'm, I'm here to help. I'm here to help. This ethics, I'm John Donovan, 5072 Castle Creek Lane. This ethics ordinance, by the way, I sent this to everybody ahead of time and I've tried to improve it. This ethics ordinance needs to apply to the full term you are elected to serve, which is normally four years. But in some cases can be shorter when a position is vacated prior to its normal term tenure completion. However, to be technically accurate, the language of the ethics ordinance should account for the time immediately prior to your initial election. As clearly as a fact that when you first run as a candidate for planning city council, you would normally begin to solicit and receive campaign contributions months before you even begin to campaign, much less the day you are elected or even more so the day you are sworn into office. So the reality is that this, the time frame of your term would need to allow for including the normal window of time prior to your election and the swearing into office. Thus, I believe that you need to add the following language to this ethics ordinance. I'm gonna put it here so you guys can see it. If y'all can do the picture thing here. Can you blow that up? Or I'll move it up or wherever, there we go. Alrighty, <clears throat> so the time frame for which the $1,000 limit will be tracked and accounted for with regard to council members recusing themselves from votes would be as follows. For first term members, from nine months before their initial election date to the final date of the initial term they were elected to serve. For re-elected members from 12 months before their election day to the final day of the second term they were elected to serve. In addition, the time frame for which a total $2,000 limit will be tracked and accounted for with regard to the council members recusing themselves from votes would apply to all re-elected members for nominations received from, from nine months before their initial election day to the final day of their second term they were elected to serve. So you can't have any gaming of the system. So Thanks, you put the thousand per term, two thousand for the total. If you happen to be blessed to serve two terms, thank you. And I'll I have a full copy that I'll give you. You can work that in. Good evening, City Council. I'm Robert Canwright. I live in uh, Plano, Texas. I am here to ask you to vote no for this change. Let's think about it. You already have something that works. Leave it alone. What is it you are proposing? You are proposing a rent a councilman amendment. That's what you're doing. What you're saying is when you come in here and you're going to make millions of dollars by changing zoning, you just have to put into your two year plan hire your lawyers, hire engineers, and buy your city council members. That's what you're doing. You're just saying, it's, you gotta just put it out two years in advance, and put it part of your planning, and hire your city council members there. That's the message that you're giving. Don't do it. You gotta remember, two mayors of Plano have gone to prison. Mayor McCall and Mayor Harvard were both convicted and sent to prison. That's absolutely true. Look it up. Just uh, check it out. Indicted, convicted, you know, McCall, Plano, Texas. It's there. Mr. McCall was not a mayor. But go ahead. There's more than one McCall here. I, okay. I so anyway, uh, this is something you got to take seriously. Don't look like you are for sale. We got a problem here from the past and have it now to you want to appear non-corrupt. Thank you. The next speaker is Colleen Aguilar Epstein followed by Patrick Charles.
Not only should Plano's ethics ordinance be retained without a time limit, it should be strengthened by requiring reporting of the contributor's employer and occupation so our citizens know who these people are. In 2017, Mayor LaRossier collected well over $350,000 from developers or real realtors, but none of those contributors identified themselves as such. Again, in 2019, he raised a huge amount of money and gave it to candidate Ann Bacchus to try to get her elected, even though he was not on the ballot. That was a way for developers to hide contributions to Ann Bacchus. In 2021, Julie Homer got $1,000 from Robert Shaw, a principal of Columbus Realty, who developed most of the apartments in Legacy West. However, in 2017, he contributed $15,000 to a campaign, so I would say that the ordinance as written, without a time expiration for recusals, is working to keep donations at a less obscene level. It was said just last week regarding the Haggard Farms development that efforts began pre-pandemic. Significant projects have often have more than two years of lead time, but seldom more than four. The same can also apply to a large city contracts and incentives. By making it four years, it adheres to any given person's full term. That ensures that if someone wants to influence a vote with campaign contributions, they're going to have to wait a full cycle or possibly face someone in midterm. Thank you so much for your time. Patrick? Then we will go on to Jonathan Goodell, followed by Bill Lyle. I'll give my time back. I don't want to. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Goodell, and this is my first time before the council, and I've only been in Plano for five years, uh, but this is quite uh, disturbing to me. Um, I, um, I appreciate the time you've given me here today but I humbly object to this proposed amendment, okay? As a retired businessman of 40 years, I well know the value of time boundaries when you're doing goals and objectives, but not in terms of an ethics ordinance. That is, as has been said before, obscene. It not only, <clears throat> it may not in fact be um, indicate um, not appropriate behavior, but it gives the image of that. And it's been said before also that we don't want to have a propriety of, uh, of, of that kind of a thing. What this does, and I'm looking at the sign that says City of Excellence, just change it to City of Lesser Excellence. Thank you. The next speaker is Judy Villarreal, followed by Justin Adcock, and then the last speaker will be Matt Dixon. <clears throat> well, clearly there's a lot, hello, by the way. There are a lot of people that uh, don't like you wanting to keep, I'm, I'm glad that you're not going to turn down this ordinance. You're not going to try to repeal it anymore. I'd be really curious who in the Dickens it is that keeps trying to repeal it. That's just really weird to me that this is the fourth time and so that you said, <coughs> until next year, we'll keep it. Why in the world would you want to get rid of it in the first place? And why wouldn't you want, to, want it to be for the full term? You know, like some the guy, the fellow that just left just said, it needs to be that you look like you're above reproach, and you should want to be above reproach. And um, I don't know, this is kind of awkward because I wasn't even nervous before I got here. But the point is, why would you not want it to be for your full term? Why would you want it to leave it open so that um, you have an opportunity during your time, if you wanted it, to accept money in exchange for favors? And you. you it just doesn't even make sense to me. If I were in your position, I would rather that, well, I don't know. Yeah, I'm pretty honest. If I were in your position, I would want there to be boundaries so that people would know I can't be held accountable to, to uh, vote what they want when the time comes. Like, you should want it for the full four years. If you don't, then people need to know that you don't. And whoever votes for, for uh, 
for it not to be extended to four years, probably people need to know that you don't want to be held accountable. That's all I have to say. Hi. Excuse me, my name is Justin Adcock. I live at 4428 Wordsworth Drive in Plano. I'll keep it short. I uh, also agree with many of the people here that it should be for four years. Uh, I mentioned this the first time I was here, but I want to thank uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Maria Tu for her leadership on this um, and for her listening to all sides. Um, I think, I, I know many of you, I know that there's no integrity issues at all, but again, this is for the appearance of impropriety. Um, I think keeping it the way it is will solve um, kind of the issue of appearances for many people. Um, on a lesser note, I think the gentlemen on the council need to step it up because they are continually outdressed by Councilman Grady every week. For So there's a New Year's resolution for you for 2022. Thank you. Matt Dixon, 1824 Burning Tree Lane, 32 year resident of the city. Currently, candidates for city council are not even required to disclose the occupation of their contributors. So citizens don't know who these people are. These occupations of these contributors should be disclosed. So we should not only keep the ethics ordinance of four years, but it should also be strengthened. It is right and proactive for the public to have the confidence that city council decisions are free of favoritism, cronyism, and the pressure of special interests. Plano should be the leader, not the follower, in ensuring public confidence in the motivations of its elected officials. Remember that Dallas is strengthening its ethics ordinance. Shouldn't Plano be doing better than Dallas? Stop this cynical weakening of the ethics ordinance. The term of the ordinance should be for four years and nothing less. There are no other speakers. All right. I'll, let's do like we've done. It seems to work pretty good. Councilman Smith, do you mind starting? Do you, gonna, you want me to go the other way? I'll start. I'll start. Okay. It'll still end up the same way. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you to all the speakers. Uh, I appreciate everybody, everybody's passion uh, on both sides on, on this. Uh, only thing I say as the uh, co-author. Uh, of this bill up until December of last year, we didn't have an ethics ordinance. So for what it's worth, we have an ethics ordinance. Uh, I'm completely in favor of keeping the ethics ordinance in place. Uh, I think, you know, four years, I, I'd be good with that. But two years, if, if we have a majority council that will approve that and we can keep the ethics ordinance in place, that's good. Uh, what, what I say is, uh, and I don't have as much experience as I guess as, as uh, some folks uh, with elections, but all I can say is, I never received a dollar. With 24 years, I'm sorry, 24 years. Woo, that would be a good one. Uh, 24 months before I, I ran for election, it, it did not happen. Two elections, it didn't happen. Uh, I never received a penny after my election. Didn't happen. I look back at finance reports. I didn't see that on other people's finance reports. So I think what, what I recognize, what I looked at when we first put this in place is it's really about the election cycle. And election cycles don't start four years ahead. They start m maybe, maybe 18 months, 18 months before the election day. So I, I think the two years is, is going to accomplish uh, you know, what we want it to accomplish. Uh, if it doesn't, we can, just like we're doing now, we can come back and adjust it. But we have something in place. We had nothing in place before December of last year. So I'm in favor, but I'm, I'm, I'd like to hear what uh, other people have to say before we have a vote on it. Okay. Councilwoman Homer. Yeah, I appreciated what Mr. Donovan said about looking back at when does the campaigning season actually start. I personally didn't make the decision to run until January, so it was maybe five months, six, six months since I was in a runoff, so I think that was a, a good suggestion to consider that timing in. I heard, uh, I, I like what Pat Greer had to say, Colleen Epstein, John Donovan, um, the, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, but you all, you all, you, you, you said things, to, to quote Pat Greer, she said, I think it's important that it's concurrent with elected officials' terms. And that's my only hang up, is that 
if you have someone in a special election, their term is only two years, plus the additional campaign time, I think that's totally fair to add six months, nine months ahead of time, whatever one feels is fair. But I think it should be uh, during the, uh, the candidate's, elected candidate's term, and then it would expire and start over again. Otherwise, I would just say four years, but because of that one exception, that's why I'm making that comment. So I, I support what many of you said. Um, this has come before us several times in uh, multiple forms, so a little clarification. When we agreed in August to pass it with a four-year time box, did we ever actually then come back and pass that ordinance with four years? Okay. <clears throat> so I, um, I mean, it's no surprise that I support the four-year uh, time frame. When uh, Mayor Pro Tem Prince brought it up in August that it should have a time frame, I fully agreed with that. Um, I, I felt that four years would be more appropriate because that's the length of uh, term we serve. Um, as has been brought up tonight, the, this is not meant to apply to contributions in general. It never was. <clears throat> it was meant to apply to people with a unique material benefit before council um, and the council members receiving contributions from those people. Um, that is not necessarily just development projects, although that's probably what we see the most. Um, but it was mentioned that the, uh, the developer last week for the Haggard Farms project said that they started this a year before the pandemic. That's well outside of two years. Uh, so it could also be large city contracts. It could be economic development incentives, major relocations. A lot of these things have a lead time longer than two years, but not very often, sometimes maybe, but not very often longer than four years. Um, I believe a provision for something like um, uh, an interim election, such as in Councilwoman Homer's uh, situation, is entirely appropriate. Uh, for a first election, maybe nine months prior to the, um, the general election date for an interim election or a special election uh, would be appropriate. I think, uh, at least I would suppose, that most people assume first-term council members are going to run for re-election. Doesn't always happen, but I I'm willing to bet... Uh, more often than not. So uh, for all of these reasons, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a reason the Dallas Morning News wrote the article they did. Um, this does elevate the city of Plano, and it is not meant just to apply to the current council or any current council members, but to council councils moving forward and meant to elevate the level of integrity that people sense in the city of Plano and in the Plano City Council in general. Um, so I've, I've said... Uh, a lot of my points around this in prior meetings. Um, I would move to amend this to say uh, for a four-year term instead of two-year or four-year period, um, except, we need to wordsmith to this, but uh, except for nine months prior to the general election for special elections um, in which a, uh, in which a uh, new council member is appointed. Is that a motion? I did provide my motion if you guys want to use it. That was a motion. Uh, okay. Yes, yes, Mayor, that was a motion. Right. And maybe it would help to have uh, to amend two years to four and provide um, a, a, an exception for special elections and interim interim elections for interim seats. The gen, the regular election for interim seats nine months prior. Okay, let, 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 me, and, and continue, let me continue the conversation. Just, just go, ahead, go ahead. Or, or let, I'm sorry, Paige, you want to address the legal issue on it? Or? Oh, no. Okay. I was, just, I, I was just saying, I'm still, and I'm fine with four years. I think, I, I think that's, fine, that, that, that's fine also, but I don't know that we need to have if, ands, or buts, and maybes, and whatchamacallits, because it's, the, the clock is always running. So even in, I got them, even in uh, Councilman Homer's position, it doesn't matter that she just got elected. If it's a four-year look back, you didn't get any donations before you decided to run. No, so, I won't, but, I won't be able to go back to the same people and I'm the same people. Right, but, 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 but my point is it's, it's an ongoing, so I think it, it, keep it simple and not, you know, too legalist. Sorry, Paige, I know we need you, but not to keep it too legalistic. But, but I'm fine with four years if, if we have enough people to, uh, to keep that and keep it in place. Well, do we, do we, do we have it? 
Yeah, but he's got a motion. So would, did, is there anybody want to second that? <clears throat> I might potentially second it. I actually had an alter. Well, I, I I have an alternative suggestion. You can amend that. I, I, okay. Yeah. Well, but, then, yeah. well then. Okay. Don't. And then. Okay. And okay. Then, we, 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 when it's my turn to speak, I I, I, I think I. <laughs> and simpler, I hope. Right. So. Maria too is going to talk now. <laughs> well, the motion the, the motion doesn't have a second, so we'll we'll keep moving. We'll, right. we'll, we can come back to you, Shelby. We'll, All right. So, from the get go. I did not like this ordinance because it's not enforceable. There's no teeth in this ordinance. Really, it's a policy. And the reason why I supported it is because it looked like people really just want a policy to, for us to uphold our um, ethical duties and to show the public that we are um, willing to be ethical and to um, do our, do our um, do our, I guess, to fulfill our position in the utmost, um, I guess, honorable way. So I was willing to change my mind and, and support it. And um, so my, my recommendation was, instead of going through all these rigmaroles of, oh, you know, if it goes up this, then we need to do this, just cap. The, the, just cap the contribution. Since more than $1,000 seems to be the issue, then they just cap it at $1,000. Well, apparently, nobody really wants to support that. So I'm sure it's, yeah, well. Teeth. A second teeth. Well, teeth and cap. But um, unfortunately, I, I'm not able to do that. So I support what Councilman Smith is saying. I think two years is good, you know, because nobody really, we're city council. Nobody starts donating to us until really, you know, it's, <laughs> we're the last resort, actually. So um, two years is perfect. Mayor Pro Tem. So uh, clearly I was the one that suggested however many years ago that we need a time limit because I'm one of those people, if you're going to ask me to follow a rule, I need to know how. So I, I don't want it to be arbitrary and me be wondering what I have to do to follow the rule. So that's why I felt like it was confusing. How, how, do you, how do you follow the rule? Is it forever? Is it for eternity? Is it for five minutes? We need to have a date that people know. And the way it's written now, to Councilmember Smith's point, it is a look back and it's easy. So you know from the date that the person steps before you, you look back two years and you know if they donated to you between that time, you need to step aside. So I appreciate the easiness that there's not really a question. If you start adding these, well, there's an exception for this, and it was nine months, nine months from when, I just feel like it gets really complicated, and then you don't have that easy break of knowing, okay, it fits into these parameters, I've got to, I've got to step off. So um, to the point that some people in the audience made about, you know, we want to be the leaders and we want to be more uh, above Dallas. Um, if we look at the contribution limits they've set, they also have an exception that you can take another thousand dollars if you're in a runoff. Um, so, so it it steps up again for the next election. This, if we set it at two thousand and you have to go into a runoff, you're done. You you still can't take another thousand dollars. So I still think we're setting ourselves um, a little bit higher than the bar that Dallas has set. Um, but I do have concerns about it being um, fair for everybody on council and to the point that's already been brought up about special elections. We have a sitting council member that's in that situation. It's not the first time that's happened. It's not going to be the last time that happens. And I think um, to equally apply this to everybody in a fair and easy way, it just needs to be two years. I'm all for simplification. Um, two years, four years. You know, I have uh, lived and will continue to live and have tried in the past to live to be a, a very ethical person. Um, to claim it otherwise is false. Um, the teeth that everybody talks about, uh, and Council Member 2 actually brought up as well, is the teeth that we saw in the past um, where council members in other cities did something that was unethical and immoral and improper and illegal 
and state and federal law change their path. So that's the teeth in anything, is the state and federal law. We don't have to write state law from this dais. Um, I don't think that that would work for us at all. So I look at this from the standpoint of how easy is it to understand and how easy it is to apply. And the more ifs, ands, wherefores, buts, and what ifs that you put into the document, it will simply convolute the meaning of the document in its entirety. Keep it either two years or keep it four years and keep it a rolling average so that we have a look back and then just leave it. Councilman Riccadelli. Thank you, Mayor. So I want to start by uh, saying I, I support uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem 2 on the cap. I mean, I, I think in addition to this, it would be great to, to have a cap. I believe, uh, you know, we had a discussion and I, I remember Deputy Mayor Pro Tem 2, I believe, was, was on that wavelength and, and, and a few of us were. But I know there, there are concerns about Citizens United and the impact of that Supreme Court decision on whether a cap can really be meaningful. I, I still think, you know, it's better better to try than to do nothing. But that's a subject for another night. Everyone knows that uh, uh, I pulled this off of the consent agenda a couple of meetings ago. I can tell you my purpose in doing so was not to belabor this discussion and have another long discussion, but just to cast my vote. I've been clear the whole time that I couldn't support going all the way down to two years. And so uh, in order to avoid voting against the whole consent agenda, I pulled it off of the consent agenda. I believe all of my colleagues on this council, current and former, have acted with integrity. But of course, as we've heard, uh, and as we all know, the standard that we're held to is not just actual integrity. We have to be above even the appearance of an impropriety because we need to inspire public confidence in what we're doing as a governing body. Uh, I fully support making this election cycle by election cycle. I also think Council Member Holmer raised a great point, and I fully support taking into account the special considerations that come up when you have a special election, because when we're going election cycle by election cycle, some council members are running before four years. And so we, 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 when the length of a term is two years, we have to take that into account. Um, but I think we can accomplish all of this without going all the way down to two years, which is only half the length of a term. Um, so if there's interest in hearing an alternative approach, and I, I think there is because I'm hearing significant discomfort from a number of council members about going all the way to two years, but I'm also hearing concern about complication and wanting a solution that's administratively simple, I would suggest the answer to that is that the slate is wiped clean and there's a reset on the date that the filing period opens for the council member's next election. That would, whether it's, whether it's in two years because there was a special election, uh, whether it's four years, when the filing period reopens, I understand we you know, frequently do take donations before the filing period opens, but it probably wouldn't be that hard to tell a potential donor you know, you donated last time, you know, I need to wait until after the filing period opens to take your donation. And I don't think any of us really started spending money before the filing period opened, so there's no need to take that donation sooner. So um, I, I, I would suggest that a, a, a very simple solution that would keep it at four years unless there's a special election, in which, in which case it would be two years because that's an election cycle, would be to just say, let's reset on the date that the filing period for the next election opens. And if, if, if that's not the right solution, federal campaign finance law is election cycle by election cycle, so there must be provisions in federal law defining an election cycle. We could also do a donation by donation standard. If there was interest in that four years from the date of the donation from that donor, you can take another donation without the recusal requirement kicking in. Or you could do four years from the date of appointment of treasurer in your first election, you know, then or two years if there's a special election. There are many different ways to do this, but I, I think the simplest is to just say there's a reset on the date that the filing period opens. And if none of these alternatives sound good, I'm also good with nine months before uh, before the, the the next election. Let me let me just say I'm I'm happy with the ordinance as it is, and just like Councilman Smith says, it, it's a good ordinance, and it doesn't really matter whether it's two years or four years I think I think we're once again trying to complicate it a little bit so uh, 
Uh, it matters to us. If you're not listening, every single yes. person that came up here said John. we want four years. Listen we, to we, us. We need to yeah. maintain yeah. order. Sir, let, 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 Mr. Let Donovan, us, let us do our business. Mr. Donovan, let us do the business. This is not your time to talk. You had your time. Well, you cut us off to a minute and a half. I'm, I'm going to ask you to leave if you don't be quiet. Mayor. Thank you. I have a question for Councilman Williams. Okay. Would Would you be willing again to keep this keep it simple? to modify your motion to just make it four years. Everything else is the same, and let's see if there's support for that. Uh, I can modify that. I would like to ask a clarifying question of uh, Councilman Riccadelli. When you say a reset at the next filing period, does that mean that come the filing period date, everything is wiped clean? Because the filing period is just a handful of months before an election. You know, I, I think that it would probably be that when the next term starts, anything given before the start of the filing period for the election resulting in that term is wiped clean. But what I was hearing was that, I mean, that would be my preference, but what I was hearing is we, we just want a really simple solution. So I would be okay, you know, in the interest of avoiding, you know, two years, the filing period is going to be only a few months short of the full four years from the election day. I'd be fine just wiping it clean on the date that the filing period opens. Shelby. I think that's a very Shelby. simple solution. Make your order. Okay. I'll, I'll second. I'll second it. Um, I'd, I'd like the provision for a situation like Councilwoman Homer's. I'm sensing significant uh, resistance to that, however. Um, I believe for multiple reasons that a flat four years would not actually impact someone in your situation. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it would for a variety of reasons, but I'm, I'm willing to amend my motion to just change it to four years. And I'll second. How would, a, how would four years not impact her? It, it's always, on, she was on a council. <clears throat> Right, because the t two reasons. Number one, the time period prior to when she decided to run is just inapplicable. She wasn't running, she wasn't considering running, it just didn't happen. Um, second, to the consideration that she's going to have to run shorter in her term than anybody else would under normal circumstances, it's not going to impact, she was gonna have to raise funds for a new election regardless. Even if this ordinance never existed in any form, she's still gonna have to fundraise. The only way that would impact her is if she were, were explicitly trying to raise funds from people she shouldn't, uh, according to this ordinance, which I don't believe that would be the case anyway. Um, so it was noted that, um, <clears throat> well actually, I can see how there would be a minor impact. It was noted that she received a thousand dollar donation in this campaign, um, but because she has to run again in two years, uh, the same contributor, same amount uh, in two years would fall within that four year period and she would otherwise, okay, so I, yeah, I can see how that would. So if, if I yeah. may interject, I, I really think the filing period for the next election, it's always, if the next election is a special election in two years, if it's the next regular election in four years, that's that date is always going to take into account when you are next running for re-election as a council member so i think you know it's it's going to do the four years unless it's a special election in which case it'll do two years i think that's the simplest solution we could possibly have uh and and so that, that i think that's the best right. solution but, but i'm open to other solutions. motion and a second I, on the floor you did okay I, what well he was he was well, contemplating it <laughs> yeah I, I made the motion okay. can i withdraw my motion if it's already been seconded <laughs> Yeah, you can. Okay. Sure. Well, no, the, 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 the scenario we just discussed about Councilwoman Homer is, is legitimate. It's very real. Um, I, I, I don't want to complicate this unnecessarily, but uh, uh, unless I'm misunderstanding, uh, Councilman Rigadelli, if we reset with the filing period, then especially for somebody for whom it's presumed they're going to run for re-election, let's say I'm going to be up uh, for re-election potentially in 2023. Yeah. If the, the filing period is, is begins in January of 2023, if there's a reset in January 2023 and somebody donates to my campaign in December 2022, assuming I'm going to run for re-election, maybe I've already announced by then, and then they've got a vote coming up in June of 2023, 
there will have just been six months between the donation and the, uh, the vote, but I wouldn't have to recuse myself if I'm understanding this correctly. That's yeah, why the look correct. back is better. Yeah, okay. that's what I don't. Well, I, I mean, I think I'm also okay with, a, you know, the, the four years and two years if it's a special election. You know, I, I think there was opposition that some felt that was complicated. I don't think that's too complicated, but I'd, I'd be very okay. happy to vote for that. Then, then I'd like to, maybe I should word my original motion. So uh, the thing is that she happens to have a two-year term for her special election, but it could be a different amount of time. I'm just saying. Well, I'm, what I was saying wasn't just a two-year term. It was four years, except in the case of somebody who was elected in a special election, which she was, even though it fell on the general election date, in which case it would be nine months prior to the regular election in which they were there elected. We However, that most simply has to be wordsmithed. I think it provides, uh, I think it provides the appropriate cover. Sure, it's a little bit more complexity, but I don't think it's, it's that complex. Anybody can do the math nine months before for general election. Yeah, Paige, you bring up a good point because it could be not two years. So I liked Pat Greer's wording of saying that it should be <clears throat> concurrent with the elected official's term. Yeah. Then that covers it. I still don't understand how that works with the way that the ordinance is written out. The way the ordinance is written now is that it, is, it specifically says that you are looking back, that it is on the person who comes before us. It's not on the council member. It's on them to look and, and disclose if they've given to you within the two-year time period before. So I don't understand how, we're, how are we going to say it's concurrent with, with your term? Concurrent with each part. That's really how are they going to figure that out? Because how are we going to? We're going to have to reword the whole ordinance to make that work. I don't think so. They'll know they gave money to her, and she'll know. Two years concurrent to her term. Uh, well, if well, you four years concurrent to her term. Nine months. However, to her however term. long your term is. So if you've yeah. got a four-year term, then it's four-year rolling. If you've got a two-year term, it's two-year rolling. Or a six-month term. Period. <laughs> Any special election could be anywhere from one minute to almost four years, depending on the circumstances in which special election were called. So, did you officially withdraw your? I, I, yes, I officially withdrew my flat four years. Um, we, we, we can try modifications of this. I'm trying to understand what there's the most support for so we don't have to go through vote after vote. I want to be efficient. So I'll just throw out there. Um, my original motion of amend two years to four years with a provision for um, people in a special election with a period beginning nine months before the regular election in which they were elected. And ending at the end of their term. I'm sorry. I, That's right. Yeah. I, okay. <laughs> oh, we're struggling with okay. math, I think. They're... I, I suggest we keep what we have and just do exactly the way it is. I, 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 so, Mayor, I, I, if, if we are going to change it, I want to see it in black and white in writing, just like Councilman Riccadelli always require us to do. Read everything before we vote. So if that's what we're going to do, uh, you know, uh, you want to table it again? Yeah. Well, let's. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what you're getting at, because we can't rewrite it on the fly. No. Exactly. No. Except we can no. change the we can we just, change the uh, date, change the amount of years. That's simple. Yeah. Everybody I, understands that. I, I think that? if I had two minutes, I could write the language. No. But I know well, that's what I'm saying. No, yep. Uh, Lisa, can you? To, if if you, wait, just, what is this agenda item saying? It's not complicated. We'll, we'll do your ordinance and if you it, deny this, it, I think you can keep what you have. If if we deny it, we can just keep what we have. And and we could we can do a four year or we can do a two year. Hey, Mayor, let, let me just say for simplicity's sake, so we can vote on it, don't table it, don't have to wait, don't have to rewrite everything. I'll make a motion to approve item four. Shelby, I'll make a motion to approve item four as written with the exception that we changed two years to four years. Oh. Uh, didn't we have a motion in a second? We already? did. We did. But you withdrew yours, though, I thought. 
No, the, I withdrew my four-year motion and I reinstated my original motion. Shelby, Shelby, still, Shelby still has his motion, the yeah, second yeah. one he did. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, did we get a second on it? I'm sorry. I'm like, <coughs> Would you be willing? Oh, I, I thought we didn't get a second. Or I thought we did get a second. Did well, you? Oh, we did. We did. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did I'm sorry. I didn't that. That. As I understand it, it's four, four years no. for a normal term, nine, like change two years to four years for, for a normal length term, uh, nine months before the election date for a special election. I, I I did second that. I think for, 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 just four uh, four, four years for is so ease, much cleaner. Uh, for simplicity, for simplicity, can y'all just deny this and then we'll keep what we have? Yeah. Let's sure. keep what we have. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> what we have has no time limits, right? Okay. Since we never. Well, the, what y'all are talking about is essentially the same yeah. as no time limits, basically. So, truthfully. All right. We'll just keep well, what we have. I was. I, I, I'm okay keeping. What we're, okay. So when, if, no time if you, limit. If you deny this, you can. It will essentially result in us keeping what we have. Oh, okay. Okay. I was trying to provide for a situation like uh, Harry, where he served for about a thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and John will serve for a thousand and one, just no. to show him. Okay. So we have a motion and a second to uh, yeah. approve agenda item four. It's uh, Councilman Williams. A motion. Uh, Mayor, I, I do have the clarified language since that was requested. Uh, I would so I, I would explicitly say to change two years to four years and add the language, except for in, for interim term members from nine months before their initial election day to the final day of the initial term they were elected to serve, and four years for all else. So if that's too complicated for folks, then you can vote against it. But that's the precise language I was asked to provide. No motion and a second for that language. Okay. So uh, to deny, we stick with the policy that you guys approved last December. Okay. So just just to be clear, we're we're saying a no vote on this would would mean no time limit. Just the, the, just the limit. Of go back to what you approved last December. You know, because uh, honestly, that that's my, no. uh, my 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 preference. But you know, I, I was trying to compromise and get get us to election go cycle by election cycle. Can, so. can I ask a question? If we leave it as no, is, with no time, time limit, no, then he, it was Shelby's motion. No, I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. Do, does that mean that that the people coming up for re-election in two years, I guess next election, if any of them received $1,000, they cannot take any more money. Excess. They, Excess. They, okay. they just can't, they just have to recuse themselves. Right. They can take money, they just have to recuse themselves. No, it's right. not if, if it adds recused, up I'm sorry. The, the wording is that the donor has to make the, um, the council person aware of their project is being considered, and then it is up to the donor to tell you that you have a conflict of interest. And that's the same language if it stays, or, it's like, or we put two or four. Or five and or six if five. the donor does not tell you and you do not know about it, then there is no conflict of interest. But somebody will let you know. <laughs> if nobody lets you know, then there is no conflict of interest. Okay. In any case, you were correct. It does not mean you can't take the money, only that if and such a situation arises. There is no enforceability arrives. issues. You okay. don't go to jail, you don't get okay. penalized. Okay, all right. You're we, correct. we have a motion, a second. Call the question. With <laughs> Councilman Williams to to vote for it would be to add uh, the amendments, to deny it, would to leave it as the ordinance is today. Everybody understand? Yes. To leaving it means it's just as it is today. There's no two-year exemption if you vote. Okay. Do you understand, Council, Councilwoman Holman? All right. Please vote. Please vote. Motion denied. Five to three. The ordinance stays as it is. With, with no, uh, no further business, the meeting is adjourned.
cyclists, pedestrians, joggers, highway workers, utility workers, and others. We are now going to take a closer look at a quickly growing group of vulnerable users, people on bicycles.